From Dallas, Texas, the flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, some 38 minutes ago. Hello and welcome once again to The Cinephiles, where we are through the looking glass, people. My name is Steve Morris. I am a filmmaker and directing instructor in Los Angeles, California. Up is down, black is white, and I don't want anybody to jump on me and go, cock-a-doodle-doo. I'm John Roca. <laughs> I am a writer and producer uh, and host here in San Diego, California. And Steve, this has been a long time coming. And brother, I am very, very, very excited and nervous and trepidatious yeah. to walk into the world of this film and break it down uh, for not only ourselves, but for everyone listening to us as well. And I want to share a little bit about how this came about, which is about a month ago, maybe a little longer, you texted me and said, hey, it's the 60th anniversary of the Kennedy assassination coming up. What do you think about doing JFK? And my initial response was, no way. (laughs) I just immediately saw how much work and complexity and stress, I mean, just the movie alone, even if this yeah. wasn't historical events, yeah. is an extremely complicated, detailed three plus hour film. So yeah. that alone is a lot. But then taking on the seriousness of this event, you know, in particular in the way we want to do things on the cinephiles is yeah. a ton. And I was frankly scared. And you were frankly right. I'm really, really glad we're doing this. I agree. And I was very happy that you changed your mind on it because. You know, both of us have had numerous conversations about things that are beyond just the realm of film, uh, and I thought this would be a perfect film to have a um, interesting and layered and nuanced and fun conversation about not only the film, but the subject matter of the film itself. And, you know, sometimes you have to go out on the high wire, and our show, most of the time, just loves to talk about movies. But every once in a while, there's a movie that comes along where we know we have to get up out on that high wire and challenge ourselves. And this is one of those movies. And so I was very happy that you were down to talk about it. And it's a great thing you're revealing too, Steve, because we don't always have these movies planned out way ahead of time. Sometimes we've got a schedule and then one of us gets an idea for a movie, passes it by the other person, and that then gets moved into the schedule. And this is one of those instances. Uh, And so I'm excited to dive into this opus from Oliver Stone from 1991. Uh, and break it all down and talk about all the things that are around it um, and see if we survive this high wire act by the end or if one of us or both of us falls off. (laughs) Well, and and speaking of the importance of this film, like obviously the JFK assassination is one of the critical moments in American history, but I have a very strange way of showing how important this movie is, which (laughs) is I was thinking about all of the movies we've done on the cinephiles Mm -hmm. that have one way or another overlapped with this film or this event. Oh, it's just a lot. So here are some of them, all the president's men. There's no question. There's connections between uh, the Watergate break in people. Like some of those people are people that were part of the CIA, part of the Cuba affair. One of the interesting ones is the French connection. Because in one of the books that I read about the Kennedy assassination, there is speculation that the dude who was the bad guy in the French connection who saved de Gaulle's life, the real person that was based on, was hooked in with the mobsters who may or may not have been involved in assassinating Kennedy and that some of the assassins, by one conspiracy theory, were French. Wow. Yeah. How about Three Days of the Condor? Yes. I think you have three days of the condor without the Kennedy. It's all about the CIA and killing right. people on American soil. Yeah. I don't know that we're do- we did the right stuff in Apollo 13 without the death of John F. Kennedy. Mm, right. Of course, for the space program and everything that he was uh, uh, involved in and supportive of in that space program, for sure. How about Dr. Strangelove? <laughs> yes. Also, yes. Which was supposed to premiere in Dallas right around when the Kennedy assassination happened. Wow. Right. Taxi driver, a story about a guy thinking of killing a presidential candidate. Yeah. Yeah. Network, a movie that is all about corporate takeover and corporate power that ends in an assassination, a conspiracy to assassin someone using people on opposite sides of the political spectrum. Yeah. How about the Godfather trilogy? Yeah. Yes. Right. You can make that connection there as well. Of course. All the stuff in Cuba, 
is yeah. all connected. Obviously, the mob, uh, and the, and a lot of that is is based on Robert F. Kennedy and Godfather II, his investigation of the mafia. Right. You know, and if you look at the assassination of um, uh, not Meyer Lansky, but whatever his character's name is in uh, oh, at the yeah, airport, yeah, yeah. it looks a lot like the Jack Ruby killing Oswald. Yes. Yes. When they're in the airport at the end. Yes. Yeah. Malcolm X. Right. Yeah, of course. Very famously connected. chickens coming home to roost. Yes. And he's a guy who's assassined, who is assassinated, who we know is being watched by the FBI. And there's still mystery about who's responsible for killing him. Yeah. Fail safe and seven days in May. Right. Both have connections and both came out right about this time. Yeah. One flew over the cuckoo's nest because Ken Kesey wrote it because he was part of the CIA's MK Ultra program that was dosing him with LSD all around the same time. And I'm going to give you one more, which is one of our most recent movies, which I don't think we have Men in Black without the CIA and the Kennedy yeah. assassination. Interesting. Yeah. Got this conspiracy to keep people quiet about something that they know they witnessed and yep. uh, erasing their memories or changing their memories so that they coincide with the overall story that they are trying to pump out. Right. Yeah. No. Now, is the fact that the cinephiles has connected a lot of movies to the Kennedy assassin assassination, is that evidence of how important it is? Obviously not. But I just like in terms of a cultural touchstone, yeah. like it just goes through. So I don't think in almost every way we would be where we are today without the Kennedy assassination. Yeah, I agree. It's a fascinating event. And obviously it's a tragic event because of who was killed and the promise and new Camelot and all of that. But I also think the symbolism of it, and it's fascinating too, because obviously we are, we're going to be six decades away from its, ha its occurrence. We're not that far away as we're recording this, right? We're about 17 days away, or no, actually less than that. We're 14 days away, two, two weeks away from when it would be. And we're having this conversation, and I think baked in inherent into the country now, since the Kennedy assassination is and the 60s, is this mistrust of the government, mistrust of, of lifetime servants mistrust of people who are trying people in power or people who are wealthy who are trying to protect certain things or to enrich themselves at the expense of anyone and also the idea that what wasn't there a line in a movie it was like oh do you want to be president no i want to be something much more important and so there's the feeling there that even being a president is no longer looked on necessarily as this highest thing you can achieve in life it's actually there's other things that have now kind of eclipsed that. But I think in, baked into our society now, since the Kennedy assassination, is this feeling that there was a chance for America to have been something else, and the death of Kennedy was the breaking of that something else, and we've never been able to put that together. And the generation that lived through the Kennedy assassination um, in their 20s, that are still alive are with us. And that in that feeling, I think still pervades our world, what he symbolized the um, people who lined up to destroy him. What were their impulses, what they symbolize. It's still something that permeates our pop culture and our, the psychology, the psychology of our country still. And I, I can feel that almost every day. Um, and uh, more and more so as we get into conspiracy theories, which is a, which has become the currency of conversation over the last few years in our mainstream uh, media. I want to I want to build on two things that you said. That the mm. first is what what I think one of the things that makes this so hard is that so much of Kennedy Kennedy almost falls in to that category of those great stars that we lost too young, yes. like like Jim Morrison Dean. or Bruce Lee, Elvis. Yeah, yeah, exactly. James Dean is that the myth of who that person could have been yes. becomes as powerful as who they actually were when they were around. And, right. and this movie 
and all of the 60s, mm. a, a lot of it is based on the myth of Kennedy. Now, maybe he would have gone that way and maybe he wouldn't. Maybe he would have been the great civil rights person that we hope that he would be and maybe he wouldn't. Maybe he would have gone into Vietnam and maybe we don't know. But that myth is so powerful that it affects us. And the second thing I wanted to mention is that I find really interesting. And, I, and look, this is going to be a different episode for everyone yeah. listening. Like, like w- w- John and I, I'll reveal something, which is that we – have almost never talked before recording an episode. I think there was one time, and I can't honestly even remember the movie, where I was having such a strong reaction, like I texted you in the middle of like, man, you got to pay attention to this movie, which I think (laughs) bugged you. And and I was, and but it's like one of, out of eight years, it's one of the very few times that we reached out to each other. And you called me about two hours ago and said, hey, maybe we should talk a little bit about this, uh, about this, of how we're going to approach it, because this is a big, it's a big topic. Yeah. And um and, and, and one just of the thi- clarify real quick, Steve. Yeah. We just clarify what Steve said. We do talk to each other in between episodes. Sure. What Steve oh, yeah. is saying is that we rarely talk to each other about how we're going to approach an episode before we do an episode. Because Steve knows I like to fly within the parameters and play within the parameters. And Steve has been great to do that in creating the parameters when he leads the discussion. This is one of those rarities where I felt the need to reach out to Steve and go, look. How are we handling this? Because I'm nervous about what's going to happen. Yeah. What What are the parameters? <laughs> like, yes, yes. What are we going to do? Well, and this is why I wanted to bring this up is one of the things I find really interesting about where we are today in this world yeah. is that when I was growing up and everyone knows, like I went to Berkeley, I grew up in the Bay Area, it was a very liberal environment. I grew up in the 70s, mm-hmm. you know, surrounded by hippies and things like that. And so the lesson that I learned on the left was we were the people who didn't trust the government. You can't trust the FBI. They investigated the Black Panthers. And what's really interesting in today's world is that has switched in a lot of ways, Mm -hmm. is that the people most crying out about what they would call the deep state or the intelligence community are now on the right. And, And what's interesting, and then you hear people on the left defending the FBI, which based on where I came up, that's pretty cool. What, you don't trust the CIA? And I'm like, no, I don't trust the CIA. And so what, what's really interesting about examining this film is, is in an examining it, I think, feel like we have to talk about how we know what we know. Yeah. And it's very like, you know, when we've done historical films in the past, whether it was Braveheart or 1776 mm-hmm. or, mm-hmm. you know, which we just did Wolf of Wall Street, I did and, and you did try to look into what really happened. And I feel confident that when we said that the princess was born on this date or William Wallace died on this date and how old they were, that we were correct on our facts. Yeah. Yeah. I am not confident. I'm going to tell you right now Mm. that I cannot, when we get to the end of this multi-episode thing, (laughs) I am not going to say, here is the truth about who killed John F. Kennedy. Right. Because I can't find the truth. Mm-hmm. Finding truth, there I I found pieces of truth, right? But it's really confusing, and I think in the world we're in today, studying how do we know what we know, and what can we be sure of, and what are we not sure of, and what is speculation versus what is fact, is something that we all need to practice. And there's no better place to practice that than in Oliver Stone's JFK. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, two things to hit what you just said. Um, I, I, I will kind of, I think for me, I'll clarify a comment you made in that you say, well, now we see it on the right that they don't trust the government. They don't trust the FBI. See, that You're absolutely right. But there's still people, those people who had been the liberals who didn't trust the government back in the 1960s have gone so far left that they have, they have gone almost around the bend to agree with some of the people that you see on the right side, uh, of politics who don't trust the government still and don't trust uh, what they're doing. And, 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 and again, we're not going to get too political on here, but we make that connection here. The COVID vaccine debates certainly have seen uh, the surprising connection of the extreme right and the extreme left agreeing that the government is oh, creating this vaccine or, or putting chips inside people to track them, both sides of the extreme uh, of the uh, a political spectrum believe that but for two different but for different reasons but coming to the same conclusion so it's a fascinating um change in the approach we see uh in our world nowadays yeah and uh yeah this is uh this and and and, and this is the thing at the end of the day it's not our job to solve the jf kennedy J, jfk assassination that's a different podcast 
it is our job to tell you why this film uh, still resonates. It's about to come out in 4K in a new re-release with all new uh, footage, all new uh, behind-the-scenes stuff, special features, and what have you, because this film, along with John F. Kennedy's assassination, still resonates for a lot of people. And uh, that's our job on this on this multi-part episode. I want to add one more thing, and I yeah. sat here debating whether or not I was going to do it, but I, I will, just because you mentioned the COVID vaccine. And again, not to get political or take a side at all, mm-hmm. I think one of the things that you saw happen with the both with the vaccine and with the COVID itself and what and lab leak hypothesis versus yeah. you know wet market and all that stuff is that what you saw, which I think is very similar to things that we saw see with the Kennedy assassination, yeah, is the truth became politicized. Yes. And therefore, in order to flog whatever political point of view you had and help the people that you wanted to help, people had to double down on a specific truth yeah. rather than investigating things. Yes. You know, it's yeah. this like, well, it's got to be this because otherwise we look bad. Yeah. And that's a really, really dangerous place to be, you know, rather than just what is the truth. That's a great connective tissue to the film for sure. So speaking of that, with what I'm going to ask before I ask you how you came to the film mm. JFK, uh, what prior to this movie was your relationship and understanding of the Kennedy assassination? Well, you know, Steve, you mentioned your earlier uh, upbringing and and the, you know the areas that you grew up in, the ultra liberal areas. I'm the son of two Bolivian immigrants, and they came to this country, so it's a completely different perspective, right? They knew Kennedy in Bolivia. My mother's high school graduation was the night of Kennedy's assassination. Oh my God. Wow. So the idea of Kennedy in our household as Latinos, as Catholics, it was massive. Kennedy was a huge thing. My father and mother drummed into my brain growing up how they loved Jack Kennedy in another country in South America, another continent. They saw Jack Kennedy as the best of America as this, the promise of America. And again, my parents are immigrants and they came to this country because of the old school promise of America. They're immigrants that came to this country in the, um, in the later years, in the 1960s, later in the 1960s to experience the country. And my father had some negative experiences when he came here, when the flower power children became angry, became violent, became much more of the rhetoric that was about attacking and destroying. So he saw the, just the end of the flower power stuff and him, he connected the death of Jack Kennedy to that. If Jack Kennedy hadn't died, these situations wouldn't have popped up. He'd have been a better president. He'd have saved America. For my mother, she remembers all these people crying at her high school graduation party because of the death of Jack Kennedy. So for me, Jack Kennedy was massive in my household. I grew up I, as far back as I can remember I knew about Jack Kennedy as like a young child, hearing the name Jack Kennedy, watching his speeches on TV, watching documentaries with my father, with my mother, or watching news pieces. So it was very big in my mind. And when I got to like 15, 16 years old, this is where I start investigating the Jack Kennedy conspiracy and the death and and going into the library and renting books and sitting there reading books in the library there in Virginia, all about the Kennedy assassination. So I was very well aware of the Kennedy assassination before the Oliver Stone movie. And when the Oliver Stone movie happened, my mind completely blew wide open about even more of the information I hadn't uh, gotten my hands on. It's so interesting. I had, I, it just, I hadn't thought about the fact that, Oh, your parents were in Bolivia yeah. when this yeah. happened. And it's just so, that's so cool because it's such a different perspective yeah. from my parents. So my parents, and I really wish I had confirmed this uh, with my mom before having this mm-hmm. conversation, but here's what my memory is. I believe both of my parents volunteered for Eisenhower when they were in high school. Oh, oh in wow. 56. Yeah. Yeah. In the 56 election. And that I know that most of my family were Republicans mm-hmm. in the forties and fifties. You know, and we had to, you know, it had to be real clear. The Democratic Party and the Republican Party have changed a lot. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And they have changed and they have changed again, you know, in terms of what that means. But when Kennedy ran my memory and again, I wish I had checked this with my mom, but that they split 
with their mm-hmm. parents and became Kennedy supporters mm-hmm. when their parents were Nixon supporters. Right. And and the youth and and vigor of Mr. <laughs> Kennedy, you know, like I think it really, really spoke to both my parents. And I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure my mom was working for the IRS in San Francisco in 63 and was at the IRS building when Kennedy was killed. Wow. Yeah. Um, and my dad was an opt- a very, very just starting out optometrist at the time. And I not only, you know, have I heard their stories of, of where they were and how profound a moment it was, yeah. I am pretty sure that my dad never thought that Oswald was a lone gunman. Mm. Um, which is interesting because my dad was kind of, my dad is a law and order, Eagle Scout, yeah. co- not conservative politically so much, but definitely a believe in America, you know, believe yeah. in patriotism. Like he was a very straight ahead kind of guy, straight but he ahead. never thought, yeah, exactly. He never thought that Oswald acted alone. Yeah. And I knew, I knew some stuff, but I don't, I didn't do what you did before the JFK assassin. I had not dug in at that oh. time. Yeah. But before the um the movie came out, um, and I remember, and at the time the movie came out, I was a big Oliver Stone fan. Yes. Um yes. Yes. and I have my feel this, by the way, is our first Oliver Stone movie, just so you know. That's crazy. Yeah. I mean, un- unless we count um uh Conan the Barbarian, which he wrote, <laughs> and his name has popped up a few other places that he was involved and came in to do a rewrite or something, but I don't think we've done a movie that he directed. No. And and I remember, and it's funny, my I know I've said it before, but my experience with Oliver Stone movies tends to be the first time I see them, they blow me away. Mm-hmm. And then the second time I see them, they are less good. <laughs> and the third time, and that's my feeling about this. I remember going to see it in the theater yeah. and being absolutely overwhelmed mm-hmm. by what it was. And then renting it multiple times. And when you rent it, you start to see the little, wait, wait, wait. What just happened there <laughs> that you didn't see the first time? What do you remember when how you first came to it? Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. I went opening day. Um, I do not remember who I was with. I don't remember where I saw it, but I do remember seeing it opening day. It was probably in Dale City, probably going to see there in, Vir- in Virginia at the AMC. There, I might have gone with my best friend Maurice Jones, who, of course, as I mentioned was the city manager in Charlottesville, Virginia, when all that shit went down a few years ago. And so we went, we probably went together and saw it and had extensive conversations about the film afterwards. But I remember there's been like five or six moments in movies in my entire life where I remember being like understanding that this is something different. And oh yeah, I felt that way in Titanic. I felt that way in Seven. And I absolutely felt that way in uh, watching JFK. There was something about the artistry of editing that came through like a like a Brando says in Apocalypse Now, like a diamond bullet. It hit me in the middle of my brain to show to see how important editing can be to a film like this. I think the this should have editing should have won Oscar all over the place for the editing in this movie. It's incredible. And in Oliver Stone's direction. This is also not only the height of Oliver Stone, this is the height of Kevin Costner. As a oh, leading yeah. man as well. So the combination of both of those things and then telling the story of one of the greatest – if of people's opinion that one of the greatest presidents ever in this country was shot down, the symbolism of youth, the symbolism of change was shot down in such a horrible way. So I just remember that experience being in the theater, watching it all, and just sitting in the theater after the – through the whole end credits, just like marveling at what I just witnessed. And then when a director's cut came out, I remember watching that as soon as I could get my hands on it. Um, and I've got the 4K already pre-ordered. So it's just one of those important films that I know is not only just technically great, but also the subject matter is of great interest to me. I think this is a hugely important film. I mean, I didn't today, but normally I say the filmmaking and the influence it has on us today. Yeah, This is a groundbreaking movie. You might not like the movie. You might have problems with the movie. You might have problems with Oliver Stone or his politics, whatever. In terms of just pure craftsmanship, this is, I would put this, I don't know how, what my list of most influential films of all time are, but this is on the list. What you said about editing is absolutely true. This is a groundbreaking film in the way that it thinks about how it makes movies. And and obviously we're going to get into that. I want to ask one more question. I don't know quite how to phrase it, but- 
when you're approaching a thing like this, yeah, what is your method for sort of parsing truth or separating truth from fiction? Or because you've got to assign a sort of, I believe that 100% or uh, that's 30%. Like, how do you approach that? Can you be specific? Do you mean approach it for this particular uh, epi- uh, uh, show? Well, I would say, I mean, it's definitely something that we had to do on this show Mm -hmm. when you're presented with a quote unquote, whether or not something is a fact or speculation, but it's also in our world today, man, where we're constantly in our bubbles are being bombarded with things to go, whoa, 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 wait, is that true? Is that an Mm -hmm. opinion? Am I being lied to? Like, how do you, what's your approach? I think my, my approach with stuff like this is always, let me read as much as I can read about my personal belief about something in my point of view. People who support my point of view, learned people, educated people, experienced people, people with a, a, a long resume, and let me read that. And then let me get into the people who contradict everything that I believe in the point of view so that I can have a much more well-rounded and educated opinion on all of this. And that's my approach. I'm never afraid to have my point of view changed or countered or challenged because I think there's something strong in defending your point of view. And I think there's something even better in learning that maybe you were wrong about one thing or another because then when your point of view comes out again, it's much more stronger after you've had it challenged than it was before. And so for preparing and just connected to how I prepared for the show today, I know what my beliefs are. And I just read some stuff to kind of get myself in the pace. But then I read a lot of people who don't believe in the conspiracy assassination, who don't like the movie. There are a lot of learned writers and educators and professors and journalists and reviewers who bash the movie, who bash the subject matter, who bash the manipulation, who compared this to uh, um, what we get now with conspiracy theories, as we mentioned earlier. So that was my approach, was to consume everything from all possible angles that I could get my hands on so that I could have a well, more well-rounded approach to the overall facts and um, embellished uh, situations that are in the movie uh, overall. So – I, I, that's very much how I think about it too. I, the, mm. the things that I that come up for me a lot is one is trying to separate, which can be really hard to do, the fact that is the input from the conclusion. Right. And and this is where we get into a lot of trouble. Is like, okay, this thing happened. Then what does that thing mean? Right. And so it's like the happen part might be correct, and the conclusion part is like, whoa, 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 what do we know about that? The second thing for me is is a bias, which is that people tend, if you are supporting the conclusion that supports what you want to have happen politically, right. or who you know, or your belief system, well, then that becomes suspect. And an example that came up, and again, not to get, I'm not trying to bring up this issue to discuss it in any way, because. I'm frankly scared and intimidated to discuss it, and it's a huge topic, but we're right in the midst of just the horrible ongoing tragedy in Israel and Gaza. Yeah. And a couple of weeks ago, there was the reported uh, attack on a hospital, yes. which at first was reported that it was an Israeli strike, and then later that was denied, and there was some back and forth about what the truth was. Yeah. I listened to a dude, he was on the NPR News Hour, the PBS News Hour, mm-hmm. and first he was an expert. Now, experts aren't necessarily people that you just because someone's an expert doesn't necessarily mean that you can trust what they're saying. Yeah, or that they're right. Yeah, exactly. Or that they're right. But it, it, he did give detailed and very specific examples of why he was right. But then what he said after saying this is why this looks like a rocket attack, not an Israeli bomb attack, and he was a a true expert. He then went on to criticize Israel in multiple ways. And the reason I bring this up is because the point that he was making, if he just wanted to just attack Israel, well, then he would have said that it was an Israeli bomb. Yes. The fact that he said, this is all of my expertise says this is not from Israel, right. but Israel has done this and this and this and this and this that I don't like. Then I go, oh, I find this person very trustworthy mm-hmm. because it was against the, the political point they were wanting to make was against the factual point that he made. Yeah. People that do that that say things that undermine their own argument, that's a person I can trust more than someone who is only following their own argument. Yeah. Um, and, 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 the, and the final one is just, how many other explanations can I make from that thing? You know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. that's those. Are, and so that's the, you know, it's like, and, and I think we, our skill set, and, and like I think about my kid, our skill set of 
parsing truth mm. is going to have to get a shit ton better because it's a lot, lot more of our world looks like looking into the K- Kennedy assassination. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah, that's a great point. Shall we at least get into some pre-production? Yeah, let's get into some pre-production 30 minutes into our show. Let's do it. So obviously the 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 most important thing that starts this movie is the assassination itself, which Oliver Stone, it was one of the most profound events in his young life. And he feels changed not only the direction of his own life, but the direction of his, his entire generation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, Jim Garrison, who obviously is the main character of this, was trying to write a very scholarly book on the assassination. And he goes to his editor, Zachary Sklar, and Zachary Sklar kind of helps him to turn it into a whodunit, mm. which is much more, which is funny because when we did All the President's Men, it was Robert Redford that pushed Woodward and Bernstein to tell the story much more about them and the yeah. mystery when they had started out just to write about what happened without yeah. them as characters. An early copy was finished and given to Oliver Stone, who read it like the day he got it and immediately bought the rights to the movie for $250,000 of his own money. Yeah. A rare thing. A rare yeah. thing to spend their own money. And he goes to meet with Garrison and he basically what Stone says is, and Stone was already, you know, knew a lot about the Kennedy assassination. He says he basically interrogated the guy, like put him on the witness stand Mm -hmm. for three straight hours. And he said he was in, first of all, Garrison answered everything he said. And Stone was incredibly impressed with his pride and with his dignity. He said, Garrison made many mistakes. He trusted a lot of weirdos and he followed a lot of fake leads, but he went out on a limb way out and he kept going even when he knew he was facing long odds. Yeah. He also bought the rights to another book by Jim Mars called Crossfire, The Plot That Killed Kennedy, which was also edited by Zachary Sklar. And here is what he said, uh, Oliver Stone, about what he wanted this movie to be. And I wanted to put it right at the beginning because I think it's a great way to frame the film, Hmm. is that he believes that the Warren Commission was a myth. And he wanted to create what he called a counter myth. Interesting. I like that approach. Now, to be clear, he's not saying I want to cr- to create the truth. Right. He's saying there's this great myth that's been created by the government, and I would like to create a counter myth. Yeah. Um, it's funny. Hoover, when we made the second Great White Shark movie, and it was his idea to put a blonde mermaid in the water with the Great mm-hmm. White Shark. It was not my idea. Right. Is that his whole point was, I want to create a counter myth to Jaws. Jaws opens with a blonde mm. getting killed by a shark, and I want to create the exact opposite image. Yeah, that makes sense. A counter myth. So uh, he starts, so Stone gets deep into studying Kennedy assassination stuff while he's doing post on Born on the Fourth of July. Um, He's going into pre-production on the doors. And it's crazy to think how huge Oliver Stone was at this era. Yeah. You know. It was quickly too, and I think that's something we should highlight as well. I mean, it starts with Al Sal. It starts with Salvador, rather with him. That James Woods movie from 1984. That's kind of like the opening salvo. Obviously, the writing, as you mentioned earlier, with Conan or whatever, yeah. what have you. But then you jump into Wall. Uh, sorry, jump into Platoon, which is an Oscar-nominated film. Then you move right into Wall Street, which is a takedown of what's going on uh, with the yuppies and American economy. Talk radio, which is an adaptation of, I think it's Bogosian who wrote the play because he stars in the mm-hmm. movie. You see that. And that's also a takedown of societal norms of what we think is allowed and not allowed the power of the media to change people's points of views, to allow them to act in certain ways because their hero is doing that on the radio. And then what that leads to when it comes to fandom. And then Born on the Fourth of July, yet another film that is exposing for Stone, who is a Vietnam veteran. Uh, exposing for him what this journey was like to go into Vietnam. I liken Born on the Fourth of July, and I, I, I've never read anything where Stone has said this, and he probably has, though, as a, a reflection of the American version of All Quiet on the Western Front. This idea of being caught up in the fervor of, support, of defending your country and fighting for your country and what that actually really means once you experience it. And then The Doors is an interesting exploration of something that he fell in love with, which is Jim Morrison and The Doors, in the 60s. So it's his way of bringing. So he was like the original baby boomer director. He spoke for people in the late 80s and 90s who were coming into their own as financial powers in our country, as leading voices politically in our country, leading voices business-wise in our country. So 
he caught the pop culture zeitgeist with these films that for the most part still endure. And then we get to JFK, which is, I think, him going to the next level, maturing past just sticking the uh, rebellious finger into the eye of the establishment and now actually ripping open the establishment and exposing it in a much more mature, educated, and intelligent approach. Yes, does he embellish stuff? Does he put stuff? Does he switch facts around? Yes, but the approach here is almost like a lawyer presenting their final um, summation at the end of a jury trial. Two things. One, do you think, it never occurred to me until you were sort of listing his credits, but is Oliver Stone the ultimate product of the 60s director? 100% an ultimate product of the 60s director, yes. Mm -hmm. I think so too. I think that particular Vietnam veteran turns on the war and then all the films that he makes attacking the establishment or tearing down the establishment, it fully comes out of that world. Yeah. Um, one of the things that has come up and it comes up today in terms of how do we do stuff, which is, is it okay when your opponent is lying constantly to lie in defense? Mm. Mm. You know? It's a good question. Like if, if in fact the Warren commission and in our entire government system is manufacturing a myth, yeah. why do we have to fight back with the Marquis of Queensbury rules and only use the truth? Yeah. It's a good question. It's a good question. I mean, you probably know where I fall on that side on, <laughs> on that is that I'm going to always kind of side with the truth, but I might not be right. You know? I don't know. I've seen many political campaigns that's, you know, kind of massage the truth, for lack of a better term, in order to th put a better person possibly in their minds in a position of power. Well, I'm going to put that farther. All political campaigns massage the truth. <laughs> All ad campaigns massage the truth. All, I would just listen to the corporate earning calls from Apple, Apple computers. They massage the truth. We're all, I mean, you and I yeah. massage the truth. Like that's we what do. You, you, yeah. When yeah. we tell in a story, we tell the narrative that works the way we want it to work. You know? Right. When I take pictures for myself on Bumble before I got with my lady, I try to take the best pictures I could of, of myself course. to massage the truth about myself. Yes. Yeah, we we tell the version of the story that makes us look better. That's just what we do all the yeah. time. Yeah. Um, so uh he's at WP uh doing pre-production on the doors, and he goes to Terry Semmel, who's a WB executive, who's been around a long time, mm -hmm. and he brings JFK to him. And Terry Semmel is the guy who is the developer in charge of all the president's men, parallax view, the killing fields. And this guy is the kind of guy that wants to make this kind of movie, and he makes a handshake deal for 20, 20 million bucks to make the film. Wow. Yeah. Which, which to me, I mean, I don't, there's no way this movie gets made today. today yes. You know? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and what's interesting is Oliver Stone brings in Sklar, the editor on these two Kennedy books, including Garrison's book, to be the writer. Mm. And the models he sees for the movie is, are Rashomon, which I totally right. see, particularly because you're revisiting the same event multiple times and seeing it in new ways each time. And then a movie that I've heard about forever and I've never seen, which is Z. Have you seen this film? No, I've never seen Z. Yeah. It is uh, It is about an assassination, I think, of the Greek president, and it's supposed to be amazing, oh. um, but I have not seen it. Um, but basically the idea was he wanted to continually go back to Dealey Plaza in the first reel, you see it in the third reel, you mm. see it. And so by the eighth time, every time you're seeing new aspects of the assassination, that was the structure. It sounds like he and Sklar wrote separately and Sklar <laughs> sent him. Okay. I finished the screenplay. Here's my 550 page script. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Even TV eat. series. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a lot. I mean, I think people have heard us say before, generally it's like a minute a page. So yeah. that's like 10 hours. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's a long time. Um, Stone manages to cut it down to what looks like a four and a half hour film that would cost Oof. at least twice as much. Wow. And they manage. And the other thing that's happening, by the way, is people are finding out that this thing is going on scripts got leaked to the press like early versions of drafts and so long before before they even started shooting there are articles being written about all the lies oliver stone is going to tell about the kennedy assassination and there are already people coming out against the film that the, the script's not even finished right yeah and, and and this is where you go to 
you know, who is trying to shut this down? Yeah. You know? Well, I also think if you're, if people are banding together to write articles to denigrate you before you even start or while you're still halfway into creating a project, I think you're doing something right. It's because the powers that be that you're going to expose sense that you've got a big enough megaphone that you will actually affect people's points of views or opinions on something. And so to me, that's what I think is was happening in that moment. This is absolutely the establishment who is now be- is in their 70s or 80s getting mad or maybe the 60s in their 60s getting mad at the punk kid who is now hit his prime as a director and he's going after the establishment to expose them with something as um explosive as the conspiracy theories around JFK cuz look this is the truth that I've kind of discovered myself as well. Just because a book sells well, it's not going to affect the public the way a movie can. A movie is immediate. Articles are written. You Nowadays, YouTube videos are made. Conversations are had all over social media. But we've always known the power of movies, especially movies dealing with historical aspects of th- or historical events, to change people's opinion, opinions in the mainstream, not just readers of books or not just uh, people who enjoy watching TV shows. Movies have a way of transcending all of that and actually putting stuff front and center. This is a studio created film uh, that is being put out by one of the up and co- no, a director that has been, that has established himself and is a pop culture phenomenon. So lo- logically the people who he might be exposing would reach out to their contacts to try to get them to write articles to try to denigrate him before he even puts a frame in front of the public. Not not to make a, another Jaws comparison, although I guess mm. I am, is that movies have a way to reach directly into our emotions yeah. and reframe the world for us in the way that books don't. I mean, it's not that books can't, books take work. You have to sit down with the book and you have to expend your effort. And yes, it can have a profound effect on you, but there is nothing as profound as Chrissy going swimming in Jaws. Like that is that experience of watching that moment in that movie complete. I changed you, right? I mean, like sharks are not your favorite thing. Nope. Like, you know, like a movie can fundamentally change your worldview. And that's why, and, and, and the thing, you know, depending on how far you take this conspiracy theory is there are people that are in power in the early nineties in our government that were involved in the early sixties in one way or another. Like one of the names that pops up is Arlen Specter, who was a Senator at the time. And he was part of the Warren commission. It's like, and so is it possible that the same people who tried to shut up Jim Garrison are involved in trying to shut up, Oliver Stone as he starts yeah. to make JFK. And and this is where as soon as you start thinking in conspiracy theories and then you get in this sort of everyone's involved kind of thing, you could get really paranoid. Yes. We were having sound problems right before recording this. I'm not saying the government was trying <laughs> to stop us. <laughs> but I'm not saying they weren't. <laughs> The opinions of Steve Morris are Steve Morris as well. Well, I mean, I served eight years in military intelligence, right? And there's only so much I can say about my time in there. And I'm not trying to be grandiose or anything at all. It's true. There are certain things I was exposed to that I've been sworn to secrecy for to the rest of my life. And then other things that I can talk more casually about. But like, I understand. And I worked and I was stationed at Fort Meade in Maryland, which is right there by the NSA. I've been to the NSA. I've worked with the NSA, so I understand the level of power that intelligence has in this country uh, from my experience as a a young guy in the Army in my 20s, like just feeling that energy when you walked into the NSA, all the hoops you had to jump through just to get into a position to do something in the NSA, you know, and so uh, the idea that they would kind of uh, have their cockles up because a film like this was going to come out and possibly expose them and expose some of the issues within the Warren report uh, and put it into a pop culture uh, uh, avenue, I imagined made a, I imagine made a lot of people upset. You know? Well, and the reality is, 
However, whatever you want to conclude, and maybe your conclusions will change as you listen to this podcast about who killed John F. Kennedy, the CIA and the intelligence community was into some fucked up shit yes. for a long time. And it is very well documented. Yes. I just finished listening to uh, The Last Honest Man, which is the book about Frank Church and the Church Committee, right. which I I had started listening to before we talked about doing JFK. It was just coincidental. Wow. But like, you know, the number of governments and assassinations and dirty tricks we were involved in that presidents may or may not have known about, that one hand didn't know what the other hand was doing, and all sorts of messed up shenanigans, that is true. I'm very now exactly how it all worked. That's where things get maybe get a little iffy. But the fact that we're into a lot of messed up stuff, including within our own country and within our own government, that is true. 100%. Shall we get into the film? Wow. Yeah, let's do it. I knew the score. But I just mm. put out of my brain that it's John Williams. Yeah, John Williams, Steven Spielberg's favorite dude. Man, the drums when they come in at the beginning of this yeah. movie, yeah. And, and and what's funny, and, we're, and we'll hear this a lot, which is John Williams wanted to do this film because of what John Kennedy meant to him. Mm -hmm. And we're going to hear this a lot. Uh, he had done Born on the Fourth of July with Oliver Stone. He had very powerful feelings about Kennedy. Unfortunately, he had a scheduling problem. Oh. which is that he was slammed doing a little movie called Hook for Steven Spielberg at the time. <laughs> now, I found Hook to be pretty forgettable when I saw it when it yeah. came out, but he was really busy. So what he did was he composed a bunch of music without seeing the film Ooh. and just gave him, here's a bunch of tracks that hope, you know, they talked to Stone about them, but didn't know yeah. quite how they would fit. And he also then saw like an hour of footage that was, mostly focused on Oswald and he created themes for Oswald based on rough cut footage, but, wow. he, but it wasn't really a traditional scoring thing where he watched the film and scored to the film. He didn't have time to do that. <laughs> wow. Okay. And what we see on screen, the first thing we see is to sin by silence when we should protest, make coward makes cowards out of men. And that's Ella Wheeler Wilcox. And then we go into, and this is, we've talked about this term before, but framing. How do we frame what this is about? And Oliver Stone makes an extremely clear, conscious choice to start his movie with what he thinks the entire Kennedy assassination is about, mm -hmm. which is we start with the very famous speech, the farewell address to the nation from Dwight David Eisenhower. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military industrial complex. I always found this speech to be so ironic because Eisenhower, obviously a very well-known military guy in World War II, becomes president basically on the heels of, or on the backs of on the back of what he did in World War II. Yet here's a guy who was very entrenched in the military talking about the military industrial complex being a danger to this country that the people involved in the milita military industrial complex will do anything possible in order to make their money off of that. And it's a dangerous path for America to walk down. And we're still dealing with the military industrial complex and how much money it needs to be fed every year. Did you know, by the way, my guess is you probably did because you're a political junkie, but that originally in the original text of the, of the speech, he called it the military industrial congressional complex. Yes. Yes. And that they had him change that. Yeah. Uh, because of uh, uh, fraying, because of uh, fraying relationships on both sides. Yeah. I think, you know, it's like, there's that expression, only Nixon could go to China. You know, <laughs> I think. Eisenhower delivering this speech, I, it's one of the most important speeches in American history, I think, because yeah. the fact that he is, as you said, this, you know, legendary military mind yeah. is the person warning against the military industrial complex, I think, and I do think this is a crossroads in America, yep. and I do think, I don't think we necessarily took the right path in that crossroads. Yeah, yeah. Why do you think Oliver Stone starts the film with this speech? I think it's so smart because what he's laying the groundwork for is, is his theory, which is that Kennedy was killed by people in power who were wealthy and wanted to 
go into war in Vietnam, wanted to fight the communists, wanted to make money off war. Uh, and the, the I've seen the phrases all the time, right? The only people who win in war are the manufacturers of weapons. Uh, and so, and we see that obviously that's a big uh, running storyline in the Iron Man series with Tony Stark and what he started doing, how casual he was about his company creating weapons that were used by the highest bidder to create wars all over the world, right? And so seeing that here as Eisenhower is saying all this stuff, and I think it's smart to lay the groundwork of where he he uh, believes why Kennedy was assassinated. But the other side of it is, in order to not seem partisan and make an ultra-democratic movie, he starts it with a Republican president warning um, the country about the incoming military industrial complex and how it will mess us up as a country going forward if we give into it. I think it's smart. It, so it definitely is a you know <laughs> lefty filmmaker highlighting a Republican uh, president, which by the way, I, and my dad had these buttons. Is I personally I like Ike. I, Eisenhower, I think Eisenhower is a, is yeah. a really good president. The you know? rare military guy who was actually damn good as a president. Yes. I also think, and, and, and this is where I want to separate out the filmmaking choice from the political choice. Right. Is that I think this is a brilliant framing of the movie because it makes the audience already thinking about this thing. Yeah. I My guess is that most of the audience did not connect Vietnam the military industrial complex to yes. the Kennedy assassination. Right. And what he's doing here is going, I want you to look over here. These, this is this scary thing. Here's a very trustworthy guy, Eisenhower liked by most of the country, yeah. uh, it's telling us this warning. And I also think this is where, you know, I said the thing of how well does someone's theory line up with their worldview? I remember when we did, we just recently did room 237 as our watch along. <laughs> yeah. And I commented on like, okay, there's the dude who studies the Holocaust, who strangely enough thinks that the shining is about the Holocaust. And you have the dude who grew up right next to, um, whatever it is where there's the native American baking soda or yeah. whatever, and that he thinks it's about that. And it's like, well, your bias, and this is where. Oliver Stone is obsessed with Vietnam. I mean, and so like the fact that he sees the most profound transformative experience of his life was being in Vietnam and that he sees the Kennedy assassination as being about Vietnam is where that's where my hackles are like going, whoa, whoa, whoa. How are you going to make this connection? Um, but the framing of it is excellent. And the last thing we hear is we must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic process. And again, I'd forgotten that Martin Sheen is the narrator. November 1960, Senator John Fitzgerald Kennedy of Massachusetts wins one of the narrowest election victories in American history over the vice president, Richard Nixon, by a little more than 100,000 votes. And this is pre-West Wing. And of course, what was one of Martin Sheen's most famous roles is he played Kennedy. Yeah. Missiles in October. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or did he play Robert Kennedy? He might have might be Robert Kennedy in that. Or is He's he played him? both. Uh, in my, uh, if I remember I think so. correctly, yeah. And we hear about him winning the election. And what we're going to get, we're going to get, look, this movie, it's a very similar challenge in a lot of ways to All the President's Men. Because All the mm. President's Men is a pure exposition movie. It yeah. is just guys talking about what happened which should be boring, and it is not. It is a thrilling film. And this is the same thing. We're going to get a ton, way more than all the presents been, tons of information thrown at us. And what we see right now is the, the rise of Camelot, is we see the election, we see him and Jackie, we see that he's the new symbol of the freedom of the 60s, signifying change and upheaval to the American public. Yeah. yeah. And we connect that through the filmmaking, to the changes in the world, including, of course, Martin Luther King and the March on Washington. Yeah. We see cross burnings and Malcolm X. We hear Ich bin ein Berliner. And we also establish the conflict with Castro. And just to clarify real quick, yeah, Martin Sheen played Kennedy in the miniseries, Kennedy, that came out in 1983. He did play Robert Kennedy, as you said, Steve, in 1974 in the film Missiles of October. And here's an extra little tidbit. In the Kennedy series from 1983, where he played Jack Kennedy, Kevin Conroy, the voice of Batman, played Ted Kennedy in that series really? for five episodes. So if you guys want to go into a, 
uh, a wormhole or a, t- a, a bit of a time capsule, find that series somewhere. Because it was a damn good series. I remember watching it. I watched it too, yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's excellent. So yeah, see a young Kevin Conroy playing uh, Teddy there. It's funny, we were talking about what we knew about Kennedy and stuff, is that now that you mentioned this, I watched. remember watching Missiles in October, my freshman year in high school. Yep. And that was my first introduction to the Cuban Missile Crisis and kind of yeah. understanding. I mean, like the amount of things that happen in the three years of Kennedy's presidency are crazy, you know? So many things that are... Uh, that change our country's future. Yeah. And we get to, which is, I think in any way you slice it is key to the Kennedy assassination, depending on which conspiracy theory you're buying into, but that is the Bay of the failed Bay of pigs invasion. Yeah. Um, because on the one hand, it could be conflicts with the CIA, uh, that lead to Kennedy's assassination by the CIA. Kennedy taking public responsibility for the failure privately claims the CIA lied to him and tried to manipulate him into ordering an all-out American invasion of Cuba. It could be conflicts with the mafia who are involved in the in the Bay of Pigs, obviously. And this is why I brought up um, Godfather 2 is like, they want free Cuba because that's where all their money is, you know? And it also, of course, brings up Castro as an enemy. If yeah. we're trying to kill Castro or overthrow Castro, then maybe Castro is the one who killed Kennedy. Right. And then we have the Cuban Missile Crisis. In October 1962, the world comes to the brink of nuclear war when Kennedy quarantines Cuba after announcing the presence of offensive Soviet nuclear missiles 90 miles off American shores. Do you think young people listening to the show today, I mean, you and I weren't alive for it. No. But do you think people appreciate how fucking scary the Cuban Missile Crisis was? Regardless of what people think, I was not alive for the Cuban Missile Crisis. <laughs> uh, but yes, and I, I don't know if a lot of people go back to revisit that and really understand how close we came to going into nuclear war with the Russians and can really grasp. I mean, because I mean, all of that gets kind of muddied when you throw in 9-11, where an actual attack happened on our shores. Obviously, you have Pearl Harbor, but that's in the middle of World War II. This was something completely different, 9-11. And then you look at the Cuban Missile Crisis. This is right at the height of the Cold War and the fear of the Red Scare. We just survived McCarthy just a few years before, right? And the Red Scare, what he was doing with those committees. And now you have Nikita Khrushchev, who I imagine many Americans, when they saw him on TV, was banging his hands and yelling, this diminutive um, beast of a man who would probably seem to radiate like he would be willing to blow up the United States in order for Russia to survive or the Soviet Union to survive. So I don't know that people nowadays necessarily would be able to grasp that quite in the same way that people were experiencing back then. I honestly can't imagine I mean, the, 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 the reality of not only, Hey, there are missiles 90 miles off the shore of you, the U S right. which means there's no, there's no warning. It would happen so fast that we couldn't do anything. Yeah. And the escalation with the Soviets of you better back down. I mean, we were, we were real close. Oh yeah. And, and, oh, yeah. and, and having read, I remember like, you know, I read all those James Clavell books and in Noble House, they talk about uh, Kennedy and Khrushchev. I've read in multiple books because it's such a key moment in history of the Cold War and the history of the United States is I've read so many different. Kennedy was brilliant. He stood up to Khrushchev. He totally saved the world. Kennedy was a fool. Khrushchev totally played him like an idiot. And this is, and, and I've read all of these different ones. And this is why, again, this is what makes talking about the Kennedy assassination so hard is because depending on your worldview, you would view this incident as completely differently and therefore view whether or not Kennedy is a threat or a hero really, really differently. And this is what I want to make clear to people. I know we're all involved in social media nowadays, or most of the people listening are involved in social media. And you think, wow, the rhetoric has never been worse than it is now. It has always been at this level. It's just there are more means to express it now than there used to be. But there have always been one thing that happens, and there are extreme uh, points of views on both sides who either support it or defend it and have no problem expressing that. We'll get to that in the first few scenes of the movie as well. So to me, this is what, if you study your history, you know 
what we've been dealing with for a long time. Do you know back in the 1940s, if you watch that Ken Burns, uh, 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 Roosevelt's documentary, there are pictures of people who were against FDR, against FDR, putting Hitler mustaches on FDR. Yes, that was done before Obama. So people have to understand, like, there is a constant state of anger to whatever is a, a flashpoint in our history uh, that one side defends and the other side uh, is against. And so it's just the uh, same thing happening here. And and rightly so, frankly, because it's really scary. Yes. Um, and just as we get off of that, we go into that Kennedy has found himself embroiled in Laos, at Laos and Vietnam. And then we have this interview with Cronkite. And again, this is the framing, yeah. which is Kennedy says, Unless a greater effort is made by the government to win popular support, I don't think that uh, the war can be won out there. In the final analysis, it's their war. They're the ones who have to win it or lose it. And this gives us the impression that if Kennedy had been alive, we wouldn't go to Vietnam. Yeah. Now, I don't know that that's true. Like, I right. know that Oliver Stone yeah. is sure that's true. Right. Yes, yes. Um, we don't even know if Kennedy wins in 64. Although he no. was popular, Nixon almost beat him. And it, and it took that televised debate for Nixon to beat him. If there's no televised debate... It's very possible that Nixon defeats Kennedy. We never have this Camelot or magic of Kennedy or the Kennedy assassination at all, Steve, if I Nixon mean, defeats Kennedy. Yeah. Well, and it's like we've had the Bay of Pigs and the Cuban Missile Crisis. Mm. There are lots of reasons to be critical of Kennedy. And I think because Kennedy's and because of his assassination is the inspiration for sort of the hippie generation yeah. and this super liberal thing, I think people uh, rewrite history a little bit to make Kennedy more like the liberal visionary peacenik that they wanted him to be. And I don't think he's that. I think, yeah. you know, you know, like Lyndon Johnson was probably like, if you were to take a, a, a racist meter and put it on Kennedy and put it on LBJ, LBJ would probably hit a higher level on the racist meter. But LBJ is also way more responsible for the civil rights legislation in the great society than Kennedy was. Kennedy wasn't moving on those things. LBJ did move on those things. So like what, where, and then LBJ is also the guy who really gets us into Vietnam. So yeah. I don't know what would have happened, you know? Yeah. yeah. That's a very good point. Yeah. And we have this, which is one of the great speeches. I mean, I love listening to Kennedy and his speech at uh, American university saying, we must re-examine our own attitudes towards the Soviet union. Our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's futures. And we are all mortal. And I think this is really smart. I must say this is controversial, I guess. This film is the greatest YouTube video ever made. It's just so <laughs> smart in how- Better than Gangnam Style? Yeah, well, that's a music video. This is the greatest YouTube video ever made because it's so smart in how it lays its groundwork for everything right from the beginning, right? Like you said, the Eisenhower speech warning us. Then we're, we find out what Kennedy has been attached to. We hear about the anger towards Kennedy. Here's another uh, interview where Kennedy is saying, uh, making it clear that he is not maybe necessarily going to go into Vietnam. And then here we have more of it as we get to this stage in the movie, as we're seeing even more of where he might be going. He might, he was going, he might not be going and where people were afraid he was going and how that would affect them. So you see that here in these moments and in these opening scenes, and he's laying the groundwork for his theory and his thesis. So you can have all the information. And then when everything start kicking off in all these scenes, you have all that information in order to see that through that prism. I, I think that's exactly what's going on. And I want to point out sort of a filmmaking technique here, mm. which is which is part of what makes this movie so revolutionary and is used throughout, which is today you hear a lot of people talk about, oh, that's made documentary style. Yeah. And what they generally mean when you say documentary style, whether it's like, you know, The Office or, or it's, you know, yeah. is, is that it is handheld camera work. Yeah. In the sense that the cameraman doesn't know what the person is going to do because that's what happens in a documentary. So the camera is catching up to the person or just grabbing onto them as if it was shot in real time and the intercutting with interviews. So you have interview footage and that's what makes you go, oh, this is documentary style. That's not what JFK is. But I want to point out what, the way that I see JFK as documentary style which is that when you make a documentary, you have a thing called B-roll. And I'm sure it's come up here on mm -hmm. the Cinephiles at some point. And what B-roll is, 
basically what the other stuff you cut to when you're listening yeah. to your interview. So, so when I would do a shark movie, if you had the guy talking about, oh, and I watched the shark swim down towards the bottom, well, then I would cut to at that moment an image of the shark swimming down towards the bottom because that would reinforce what you were hearing happening. Right. So B-roll is the other footage that you're showing. This movie is filled with B-roll. Yeah. Yeah. And it it is constantly showing you images to reinforce what your characters are saying. And some and what's what's dangerous and why this movie is and should be controversial and should be examined carefully is that sometimes the B-roll that you're being shown mm-hmm. is truth. Yes. And sometimes the B-roll that you're being shown yeah. is speculation. And the same actors with the same footage is do- are doing both of them. There's no differentiating which is which. And what people don't understand about and why B-roll is so powerful and effective is that it's hitting you emotionally. And you're going, It's this is the truth. And I want to relate it. When we did the Ken Burns Civil War documentary, mm-hmm. one of the comments that has always stuck with me was Ken Burns would do these amazing recreations of these battles using sound. So you'd see old photographs, you'd yes. see the current images of the battle, and then you would hear the sounds of the orders and the cannons and the gunfire and the screaming and all of the stuff. And people came up to Ken Burns after that movie came up and said, wow, that newsreel footage you had of those Civil War battles was just amazing. Because they actually believed that they had seen it. Yes. Even though there is no video, there's no movie of the Civil War, that technology didn't exist. But and there the is no audio of the Civil War either. No, there's none of that exists. But the combination of the sound that he created and yeah. the images that he showed you made people feel like they had seen it. That is what's happening throughout this entire movie. I yeah. saw Oswald talking to this person. Yep. Therefore, that must have happened. And maybe it happened. And maybe it didn't happen. And that is what and, – and one example right here because – Part of this opening with the Martin Sheen uh, narration is to show us, to make us love John Kennedy. Yes, of you course. Because Martin Sheen has one of those voices. Yes. Yeah. And the last thing that we're seeing after he says this thing about, we all cherish our children's future, we are all mortal, mm-hmm. is you see shots of Kennedy at his wedding. You see shots of him mm-hmm. with his family. And I mean, you know, there's no, there are few more photogenic presidents than John Kennedy living a more photogenic life than he yeah. lived with his family. And the last thing we see is this horse that sort of nuzzles him and he breaks out in laughter. And the beauty of John Kennedy and the joyousness makes you fall in love with him at this moment. And again, this is so smart by Oliver Stone, making you love the person that he is about to show you has been assassinated by this what he believes a cabal of conspiracy uh conspiracy and a cabal here to destroy this good looking youthful happy incredible person so you have to love this person so that you can go along with the story and want to find out what happened it's so smart filmmaking wise and what's also smart is that then we go into contrast because we've essentially been into a documentary up to this point. Yeah. You know, we've had real footage. It's all real footage. We have narration. It's very much in the documentary world. And then he shatters that by this really scary, jarring footage of this woman getting thrown out of a car. You fucking asshole! You come back here! And one of the things we see, by the way, is this is shot in 16 millimeter black and white. So it's like, has a totally different look. And this is Sally Kirkman, who is uh, Rose Sharami, I think is the, the actual person's name. And she was thrown out of a car by Jack Ruby's men. And she is crying and bleeding. And this is building with that John Williams music to Kennedy and Jackie getting off the plane in Dallas. They're going to kill Kennedy. We know that we're driving towards the assassination. We have this woman who'd been thrown out of a car in a hospital bed, screaming. These are serious fucking guys. And this is Sally Kirkland delivering an incredible performance. She had been nominated, I think, for Best Actress a few years earlier. I cannot remember what the name of the film was. She had come, kind of come out of nowhere and got nominated for Best Actress and then kind of receded back to where she was. So having her be a part of this, this is the beginning of all these incredible cameos from a wide array of actors who were well known here in the early 90s and sally coming in and by the way shooting it in black and white 
making which already puts you in a mindset because you had just seen black and white newsreel footage. Exactly. This makes it feel like, oh, this actually happened. Subconsciously, for the viewer, it makes them believe this is actually part of the newsreel footage they're seeing. Her reaction is so well done. Her reaction in that bed when she's in the hospital bed, <laughs> they're gonna kill Kennedy. You see that, and you can also see why someone might see that as a crazy person that they don't need to listen to. So really smart to begin it in this way, where you see a woman who's in a in terrible condition and in dire straits, and her reaction to everything and her desperation to get someone to listen to herself. So interesting. Yeah, I think it's so powerful and it's scary. I mean, it's Jack yeah. because of course, yeah. you know, <laughs> there's no spoiler alerts here. We know that he's about to get killed. We know where he gets killed and when he gets killed. So when she's saying they're going to kill him and the doctors are underplaying it, like, oh, she's on something. It's right. horrible. Right. And the other thing that's going on is, you know, just, <laughs> spoiler alert, but Oliver Stone's theory is that the government is behind the killing of Kennedy. Yes. That some combination of the CIA and the FBI and the military wanted Kennedy dead. Yeah. What is John Williams' music playing right now? Military uh, drums. Yeah, the drums, yeah. That is a conscious choice to reinforce who is behind what's going on. It's so smart, the decision of the style of drum to play as well. It is strong, it is defiant, it is staccato, and it is sharp. And so you're immediately, um, again, you're put viscerally into a place of unsettledness of what you're about to witness. The cinematographer, by the way, is Robert Richardson, who does tons of stuff, including with Stone, Platoon, Salvador, Born on the Fourth of July, The Doors. He did Eight Men Out. He did Casino, A Few Good Men, Wag the Dog, and Nightmare on Elm Street, by the way. <laughs> um, and, uh, and he had a huge job because they had, from the beginning, this idea, yeah, we're going to shoot on 35 millimeter. But we're also going to shoot on black and white 35 millimeter, on black and white and color 16 millimeter, on 8 millimeter, super 8 in color and in black and white, and on videotape. So we're going to be using all of these different formats, and all of those require different lighting, different setups. But that's why, and you're cutting, which I, I, when I was taught in film school, they were very much like, you can't top cut between multiple mediums, and it's too jarring to the audience. And this movie is obvious proof that no. If you have great editors, you can do yeah. this. Yeah. And what Oliver Stone is going to do is he's going to show you a thing and you're not going to know what the fuck it is until later on in the movie where he fills in those gaps. Yeah. So he's planting things, just images that will strike you knowing that he's going to return to them and to return to them until they become ingrained with you. Yeah. And this is the building of the, the assassination at Dealey Plaza and little things like, you know, we see mixed in with actual footage of Dealey Plaza from 112263, we start to hear the sound of a film camera playing, which is, of course, reference to the Zapruder film. And you see Zapruder standing on one of his things, you know, on the knoll when he's filming, but you don't know that you're seeing that. Right. I don't know that you, I'm sure you did. I don't think I knew what the Zapruder film was before seeing this movie. Right. See, for me, this movie was like nerd central for me because I'm right. like, I knew everything he was referencing at the beginning, right? As the movie goes along, I didn't know as much about the minutia of Garrison's investigation, but this stuff that he's laying the groundwork, he's hitting the greatest hits for those of us who know about the conspiracy. Right. And for those who don't, he's laying, as you said, these, this little groundwork that he's going to come back to later on and that you clocked but didn't know it was important till he reinforces it later on. So again, super smart filmmaker and editor to create this uh, beginning here. What a crazy kind of fan service. Because <laughs> it's like, it's it's right. Kennedy political junkie fan service. Yes, you know? 100%. 100%. Um, and, and, and filmically, the way this is done is so great because you have those John Williams drums you have the sound of the film running, the yeah. drums cut out. We see Kennedy in this slow-mo shot wave. It's right up before this moment. And then the music is gone. We cut to black. We hear the sound of a rifle bolt. And then you hear that gunshot in the black. And then the black and white shot of the corner of the building with the birds flying off. It's doves. It's the breaking of peace. It's the shattering of peace. 
Um, which by the way, Oliver Stone said that in one of his interviews with, cause he interviewed tons of the witnesses that were there that day, that someone saw exactly that, that they saw all these birds fly off the rooftop when the gunshots happened. Interesting. Okay. Now, whether or not that's true, I don't know because the image is beautiful. I think it's just beautifully done. I agree. And then we hear the news report. In Dallas, Texas, three shots were fired at President Kennedy's motorcade in downtown Dallas. The first reports say that President Kennedy has been seriously wounded by this shooting. I love how Stone teases you with this stuff, is that then we haven't really seen all of the Zapruder film, but we have that shot of Jackie on the trunk of the limousine and the Secret Service guy trying to get onto the back of the car. Yeah. That shot is so moving to me. Yeah. What I, I had always assumed, and maybe you knew more about this than me, that she was like trying to help the Secret Service guy get on the car. No. She um, was it, trying to escape. And not and that isn't a negative. She was trying to escape uh because her husband had just been shot and killed. And she thought she might be next. It was the Secret Service guy who was telling her to get back in the car, uh, because the safest place she could be is there because they've moved out of the triangulation area so that she was trying to get her to stay in the car and duck under can i tell you something crazy yeah and this is like perfect this is a perfect encapsulation of why it's so hard to know what the fuck is happening (laughs) which is that which is that i was watching so oliver stone came out with this documentary called jfk revisited i'm an hour and a half into it yeah yeah and i'm and and what i realized is that i thought it was just a two-hour movie i think it's a four-hour movie so i'm halfway through it (laughs) <laughs> By the time we finish this thing, I will finish the whole thing. But but what you probably haven't gotten to yet is there is a dude who what he says is happening is that there was a piece of John Kennedy's brain on the trunk of the car that she was trying to pick up. Oh, wow. Yeah. Whoa. Okay. I didn't know that. I don't think I've ever heard that. Oh, I never had either. Well, well this okay. is what I mean. It's like. My mind on it. Yeah. I looked at the footage and I went, is she trying to help the secret service guy get onto the car? You look at you footage and probably maybe heard other people who said, yeah. no, she was trying to escape. That's Perfectly reasonable. I, then I hear this guy say, she's trying to grab a piece of brain. And it's like, well, I can't, we can't know, you know? And I don't think Jackie's ever said, and I don't, I don't know too much research on this because Jackie didn't talk about the assassination too often. So I don't know that I've ever heard her say, or uh, be interviewed in print and say what she was trying to do. And, how much of that would you actually believe, you know, that she's saying? So, yeah. And then we go to New Orleans and Jim Garrison, Kevin Costner, and uh, one of his associates, Lou, who's J.O. Sanders, comes in Love and him. says, he's great. He's so great. Boss, the president's been shot in Dallas five minutes ago. Oh, no. I think it's super important that at that moment, Jim Garrison looks at the clock. Because what is the one thing that you hear about everybody's story about the Kennedy assassination? Yeah. What time it was. Yeah. And where they were. They remember. I remember this moment. How bad? There's no word yet, but they think it's in the head. So let's talk about Kevin Costner. Okay. Would you like to know the two first people that Oliver Stone went to for this part? Ooh. Mm, Yes, I would. Is it Robert Redford? Oh, that would be good. They're both good. Okay. Mel Gibson and and Harrison Ford. Oh, Harrison would have been perfect. Jesus. And and they both say no. And Costner says no. Really? Okay. Michael Ovitz is Costner's agent. (laughs) He calls up Oliver Stone and says, let me work on this. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Uh, Michael Ovitz, for those people who don't know, very powerful agent. Yes. Um, and Costner changes his mind, says yes, <clears throat> then goes and spends from what, and this is what we always hear, but, you know, I, I'll believe it for this, that he spent extensive amounts of time with Jim Garrison, who's quite ill at this point, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Done t- tons of his own research. And in the midst of them getting ready to shoot this film, this little movie called Dances with Wolves comes out. <laughs> wins all the Oscars and suddenly <laughs> yeah. the casting of Kevin Costner, who was already on the up, you know, like was having a moment. Right. He's now the biggest star in Hollywood period, you know, after dances with wolves. And we hear more from the news reports and it's sort of the experience of how Jim Garrison and the other people at that time were finding out about what went on. 
Um, and we're in this crowded bar. And again, I think this is beautifully shot and it's really well acted. Just the, the pain and the somberness of everybody sitting by that TV trying to find out what happened. Yeah. And by the way, this is why costuming is so important. Everybody else in that bar is wearing somewhat muted colors. And here is Costner with mm. kind of the lighter yellow, the cream, the white shirt. He stands out. Not just because he's also good looking and he's a movie star, but also the, the suit that he's wearing uh, were, it just shines a little brighter because he's going to be our yep. everyman and our shining white knight. I, I can think of several moments where I've had this experience of mm. it could still be okay. You know? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And and there's the moment where they say that blood transfusions are being given and the priest has administered the last rites. Yeah. And the camera pushes in on Lou and Jim and he says, There's still a chance, Dan. Come on, Jack. Pull through. And then you get the footage of Cronkite. From Dallas, Texas, the flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. Yeah, this is legendary footage of Walter Cronkite because this wasn't done. He Walter Cronkite, for people who don't know, and certainly a lot of young generations probably won't know who are listening to us, but Walter Cronkite was essentially something that he was the last of a dying breed, which is a newscaster that everyone, no matter what political um, bent you had or point of view you had, everyone trusted Walter Cronkite. He was the most trusted name in news. And one of the reasons he was so trusted is because he never got emotional. He delivered the news, no matter what it was, straight ahead. So, And they would say, and that's the end of the story. And what happens here is legendary that he broke when he talked about the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And that never had happened before in Walter Cronkite's career. And that became legendary for people. And that allowed people even, gave permission to people to grieve if even he was affected, yeah. I can be affected now at this. And it tears galore. Vice President Lyndon Johnson <clears throat> has left the hospital. Presumably, he will be taking the oath of office shortly and become uh, the 36th president of the United States. The camera pushes in on Jim. And as he's, you can see how strong, I, and I think Costner plays, this might be among Costner's best performances. 100%. 100%. I always, I like him, yeah. but there's a certain, I never think of him as the most complex of actors, you know? Um, <laughs> Isn't he a Bay Area boy? I thought he was a Bay Area boy. I don't is think he? so. Is he? Okay. All right. I don't know where he's from. Uh, I, I don't know if he is, um, <laughs> but I think in this performance, he really taps into something. And it's so crazy because in this moment of mourning, this guy at the bar starts applauding because he is happy. That Kennedy was killed. And I think, again, this is so smart of Oliver Stone to show you that although we were caught up in this feeling of Kennedy being this hero and this Camelot and all this stuff, there was this more nefarious contingent of people who did not like Kennedy, hated what he represented. These are the people that voted for Nixon. And so he is showing you. Again, from the beginning, this balance here that I think is really smart for a filmmaker to do because it's really easy to just go with one point of view and go down that road and do a movie in an echo chamber. The fact that he is showing you both sides of what people felt about Kennedy and not letting and not showing people like 10 people descending on the dude and beating him up. They're yeah. just letting that hang in the air, you know? Well, I think we can think in our lifetime of several times where if one of our presidents had been killed, there would be people celebrating. Yes. Right. You 100%. know? Yeah. By the way, this guy who is celebrating is a man named Perry Russo. And Perry Russo, the guy playing this part, is one of the sources for the Willie O'Keefe character, Kevin Bacon character, who te <laughs> this guy testified against Glenn Shaw, wow. who hated, hated Kennedy. This was completely sincere, him being happy that Kennedy was killed. Wow. Yeah. And Jim Garrison says, God, I'm ashamed to be an American today. That's such, you could not get away with that line today. People are so hypersensitive about that. And I remember listening to that line this time around for the show today, over the show that we're doing right now, Stephen, I thought to myself, man, you could never, 
have your lead actor who's supposed to represent the everyman say that in a movie nowadays. I, I would, it's funny. I would put this almost in the exact, I agree with you, but I'm going to put it in the almost exact opposite way, mm. which is, I think Jim Garrison in this movie in 1963 for him to say, I am ashamed to be an American is a shocking statement. Yes. To have someone say that in a movie today is not shocking. Okay. I, I think, we, you know, Donald Trump, all sorts of people were saying they're ashamed to be an American. We hear it all the time. Yeah. You know, for different reasons. Sure. Whereas the World War II generation, that was a big thing to say. Yeah. Um, and, and what's so funny, because he does this thing where he sort of shows us things before we're going to see them. So you see Ed Asner. Yeah. You don't know anything about it. You just see him. And then we cut to these witnesses being interviewed. And the first witness is someone we just talked about in another film, which is Vincent D'Onofrio. The bullets were coming up over our heads from that fence up on the mole. I seen his face when it hit. He just, his ear blew off. And he turns us real white. And he is immediately saying something that is going to come back and come back, which is, uh, the shots came from over our heads up on the knoll. Yep. And this, we're going to hear, these are terms, if you know about the Kennedy assassination, the grassy knoll and the book depository and the, the fence and all these, the, these locations that get talked about over and over and over again. And then we see, and I, had, I really had forgotten how many amazing actors there are in this movie because yeah. after Vincent D'Onofrio, we get Ed Asner and Jack Lemmon. Oh, what an interesting twosome these guys are, right? I mean, this is Ed Asner leaning into the evil uh, aspects of what he could bring to a character. And Ed Asner, a lifelong hardcore liberal, yeah. playing a character like this. And Jack Lemmon playing status. Jack yeah. Lemmon, who can lead films, who was nominated for Best Actor for The, the Apartment, all these other things. And here he is in this, in this um, uh, film – playing a guy of lower status and he plays it so well with Ed Asner. It's fantastic. And you know, these guys, you've seen these guys at your local watering hole in time and, and before. Well, and they're no, and we know these guys as actors, like they're actors yes. that we, and this is one of the Oliver Stone's idea. He was sort of inspired. He loved movies like the longest day, which are these, you know, huge right. multicast things. And what he thought was he said, if I can cast these known actors in these supporting roles, that it, this is what he said. He said, it will provide a map of the American psyche. Mm -hmm. Familiar, comfortable faces that walk you through a winding path in the dark woods. Super smart. Super yeah. smart. And I just got to say, you know, you said how Jack Lemmon plays status. I mm -hmm. think he might be the best at that. Mm -hmm. The ability to place himself in a very specific status. I mean, like we did it, you know, we had him in um, Some Like It Hot, where mm -hmm. he is underneath the status of Tony Curtis. And here he's so clear. And I, Jack Lemmon, and we haven't done a huge Jack Lemmon movie yet, which yeah. I there are several that I would love to do. But his ability to subtly make a character just come completely alive is amazing to me. Yeah. By the way, both Jack, part of how Stone got all these guys, Jack Lemmon and Ed Asner both loved Kennedy. Jack Lemmon absolutely believed there was a conspiracy. And the moment he had a chance to do something uh, about it, he was like, yes, yeah, sign me up. I'm in. Now, we've said that Ed Asner is a well-known lifelong liberal. That is not true of oh. Guy Bannister, the character oh, right. that's oh, playing Bannister. here. Right, right, right. <laughs> And he and he's great at playing the scary, angry, horrible person of Guy Bannister. Yeah. All this blubbering over that no cut son of a bitch. They're born like they knew the man. Makes me want to puke. You gotta say, Chief, the president was shot. A bullshit president. I don't see anybody crying for all those thousands of Cubans. That bastard condemned to death and torture had a bay of pigs. Where have we heard that before? And then we come back with Guy Bannister, even drunker, going off on racial epithets and Jews and Catholics and you know, watching Jack Lemmon. Again, he's just so good at this. Watching him get uncomfortable and like looking around at the rest of the room is great. Uh, Chief, now maybe you had a little too much to drink. Bullshit. Oh, There's a new frontier. 
Camelot and Smithereens. I'll drink to that. Pours out his drink. And then we hear, and it is crazy how fast all this happens. A flash bulletin. Dallas police have just announced that they have a suspect in the killing of a Dallas police officer, uh, J.D. Tippett, who was shot at 115 in Oak Cliff. That's a suburb of Dallas. Police are saying there could be a tie-in here to the murder of the president. This is how fast they have Oswald. Uh, And this is the first time we see him, and we see that he's Gary Oldman. I didn't, I I had already liked Gary Oldman and seen him in stuff before this. Yeah. Who knew the fucking career he was going to have and the oh. range this guy. Yeah. I had never watched The Darkest Hour until recently. Mm. Holy shit, man. So good, man. One of my favorites. I go back to it all the time, man. I'm a big Churchill guy, so uh watching him play him is excellent. I watch scenes all the time from it. And of course they just for those of you who know about this show on Apple TV, if you're not watching Slow Horses, he's incredible in that show and they just debuted the third season trailer coming on Apple TV mm. as well. I, I've heard it's great, but I haven't watched it. Mm. And we hear him in that odd clipped Oswald sort of way of speaking. No, sir, I didn't. I don't know what I am charged with, but I emphatically deny these charges. And now we're walking home with Jack and uh, Ed Asner, and he wants to, he's seen that Guy Bannister is getting very dangerous and he's trying to get away and Guy Bannister won't let him. They end up at back at the office and Ed Asner plays a great drunk, by the way. Oh my God. Yeah. Scary drunk. I do not understand. I've known some scary drunks and, and mm-hmm. I don't know. It's like, well, why are you doing this? Like what's, I'm a happy drunk. <laughs> the human mind is a quagmire, man. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> true. Well, bless my soul. Uh, yeah, all these years I thought you were on my teeth. Yeah, sometimes I don't know. Are you kidding? I couldn't be more serious, Jack. Red eyes of yours have me wondering about your loyalty. And he starts to get paranoid and believes that he has been through his files. Yeah. And and then he says exactly the wrong thing. He says, You're a goddamn spy. Why the hell would I want to look through your files? Gee, I've seen enough here this summer already to write a book. <laughs> it was not the right thing to say. No. What do you mean you're going to write a book? Well, no, I mean, well, do you, you know what I mean. We've seen a lot of strange things here. Strange people. By the way, so Jack Martin is, which uh, Jack Lemon plays, a real person, was je- really interviewed by Jim Garrison. He oh. says yeah. the thing that he said before Guy Bannister pistol whipped him is he says he said to Guy Bannister, what are you going to do? Kill me like you all did Kennedy? Wow. That's what I read. Hmm. you know that that and and i i think i believe that that's true but regardless yeah. uh guy bannister beats the crap out of jack bart uh martin and i believe accidentally ed asner hit jack lemon with the gun <sighs> Oof. uh and jack lemon was a fucking pro and got up had a big bruise and said let's keep doing the scene <laughs> it's because he's a star man yeah it sounds like everybody showed up full on to do this movie. Yeah. We're back at the Jim Garrison house where he's uh, watching the news, sitting with his wife, Sissy Spacek, who plays Liz Garrison. Yeah. And immediately she sees Oswald on the news and goes, well, he's a creep. Right. She's been, fa- she's, and that's what she symbolizes is like the mainstream uh, audience that they were trying to manipulate to believe certain things with their narrative, the conspiracy people were trying to do to make you see this person in a certain way. And so she serves that purpose in the movie for sure. And by the way, I'm, I'm gonna get in trouble for saying this. This is the sexiest sissy Spacek I've ever seen. And so I'm, I'm just going to put that out there for whatever reason. I find her to be incredibly sexy in the movie, um, in her, uh, 19, what sixties Bob and, and clothes. Well, I think you've revealed something important about yourself. I don't know why you'll get in trouble for it, but <laughs> yeah, um, not trying to objectify her. She's a great actress. Yeah. Um, I, you know what? I, I think I feel like uh, at some point we have to move beyond the fact that people find people attractive and that's actually okay. Yeah. You know, that's just humans being humans. John Kennedy, um, hotty. Absolutely. All right. Yeah. Anyway, let's move. <laughs> <laughs> so, and what we're seeing is Oswald being interviewed, saying that he doesn't have any legal representation. He has no assistance. He doesn't know what's happening. 
I, uh, I, I really don't know what the situation is about. Nobody has told me anything except that I'm accused of um, murdering a policeman. And they ask him, were you ever in the Free Cuba movement or whatever that's called? Mm-hmm. And out of the background, someone, which is the actor Brian Doyle Murray playing Jack Ruby, yells, That's the fair play for Cuba committee. So, first of all, this is, from everything I've read, this is absolutely true. Jack Ruby was there at this moment and did call this out. And that is so bizarre. That is bizarre. Like how, you're, over, you're overplaying your hand almost. Yeah, I mean, like... Why would Jack Ruby, and and we don't know, so it could be that Jack Ruby, who's going to kill Lee Harvey Oswald very soon, is exactly what he says that he was, which I think both you and I don't think he was, that he was just a patriot who didn't want Jackie Kennedy to go through the terribleness of a trial. And that's why he killed Oswald. Do you find that explanation credible? No, not in the least bit. Considering what Jack Ruby was, not at all. I think it's all bullshit to cover up what he did and his role in all of it as well. So that's my personal opinion. Yeah, I, it's, it's bullshit. Of course it's bullshit. Yeah. Jack Ruby is a mobbed up guy with all sorts of ties to all sorts of people, all sorts of ties to cops, pro- probably from everything I've read, a gun runner to Cuba. You know, And this is the big one, is if you knew nothing about Oswald, how the fuck do you know that it was called the Fair Play for Cuba Committee? Yeah, right, right, yeah. I mean, that was a non-existent thing where Oswald tried to hand out some pamphlets in another city. It wasn't in Dallas, it was in New Orleans. So how the hell would you, standing in the back of the police station, (laughs) know this piece of information and why did you yell it out? Yeah, 100%. And then we get a bio of Oswald, which is, he was a Marine, he became fascinated by communism, He is still believed to be a dedicated Marxist and a fanatical supporter of Fidel Castro and ultra-left-wing causes. He spent last summer in New Orleans and was arrested there in a brawl with anti-Castro Cuban exiles. Is there any life more bizarre, confusing, and impossible to understand than Lee Harvey Oswald's? Yeah, it's a it, when I as I said when I started getting into this as a teenager, diving into his story and how all this stuff kind of played out and what he went through and what he was allowed to do and how he was allowed to go to Russia and come back and all these stuff. It it sets off all kinds of red flags. And so, yeah, it's a really interesting life that he lived all the way up until Jack Ruby shot him dead. So just fascinating stuff with him. Um, And I wonder if he was groomed from like day one. And we hear this about Especially people back in the, in those days with CIA, what they were grooming people at very young ages to get them to be in service to them. Yeah. I this is where I go. I do not feel confident saying a conclusion, like saying I think this is the truth. Right. But I am very confident saying that the standard, basic, you know, uh, timeline for Lee Harvey Oswald has to be bullshit. Yeah. On, you know, like they can't, they, you know, it's like they, it does, it just doesn't add up. There's so many things that don't add up. They're obviously, you know, like my belief is he, in some level, he's involved in intelligence, but exactly what that means, I don't know. But like, it is just completely bizarre. Yeah. But the big thing that comes up is that he had spent time with New, in New Orleans. And this is really the, the, the inciting incident is like, oh, there's a connection to New Orleans. So Jim calls up Lou, his right-hand man, and says, yeah, we got to go look into this. And I like that the way they present Garrison from the beginning is not someone who is like gung-ho to go after the Kennedy assassination or whatever. He's just doing his job. And he's crossing his uh, T's, dotting his I's, making sure we're cool in New Orleans and our our side of things are handled. You know, there are a lot of reports that'll tell you Garrison was a glory hound and so, uh, you know, a spotlight seeker. Um, but how much of that do you believe? I don't know. Uh, so, but certainly the way they presented him uh, from the beginning here, I think, is a smart move for a protagonist that you're going to follow through this whole uh, movie. You don't want him to be too gung ho too early. Well, and I think it's in perfect contrast with what we're about to see. I think the way they're setting up is there's a procedure. If he was in New Orleans and was arrested, then obviously we need to make sure that we know everything about that because this is the most important investigation in the country ever, possibly. Yeah. And so we got to find stuff out. And so he's it's not that he has a 
pro Oswald, anti Oz. He has no opinion on anything at this moment. He's just like, well, we need to obviously look into that. And then you cut from that to the Dallas district attorney, which is essentially the Jim Garrison counterpart, yeah. who is Henry M. Wade, who says, I would say that without any doubt, he's the killer. The law says beyond a reasonable doubt and to a moral certainty. What do you think about the Dallas district attorney saying this at this moment, this soon after the assassination? Yeah, I mean, the way it's presented in the movie, because we don't know, we don't get a timeline, right? We don't right. get okay, at this date, at this time, he said this. This could have been like a month later. We don't know um, when this is presented. So the way it's presented in the movie, it feels like, wow, they got a biography of this guy really fast. Wow, this person already, this person already thinks he's guilty. Um, which you really you should not be saying on TV if you believe in the American uh, not guilty until or not uh, innocent until proven guilty uh, foundation that we have in our in legal system. So this is an odd situation, but you know you also have to want you also have to wonder why would they choose why would he be killed in Dallas in Texas in the southern hotbed of what is still very much a red state? Why would this happen? A very Republican. Leaning, these are the questions you ask. And this Dallas uh, a DA is like, already ready and whatever it's done, it's we're not going to do much more investigation. Let's wrap it up. And so it does radiate like, again, you, mentally as you're watching this, you're like, oh man, these people were lining up. It is a conspiracy. So filmmaking wise, it's smart to put this in here. But I do think what he's saying is way out of turn. I So, so first of all, I'm really glad you brought up that we don't actually know the timeline. Right. And that is so key for all of this footage. It's like, and, and this is the thing, you know, that I've known for a long time being an editor, but like, I can make it look like you said whatever I wanted you to say. Yeah. And so where you place something, what, you know, maybe there was a, a line before or a line after or how the question was phrased, it all could change the context. So I'm really glad you pointed that out. I can't imagine any way that anything is a moral certainty about the assassination. And, and, and one thing I'll say is like, um, again, I cannot come to a conclusion about exactly what I think happened, but yeah. I can say that the investigation was botched. Yeah. You know, there's just no oh, question oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that the way this was handled was fucking terrible. Yep. You know, 100%. so I should say that the, the book that I read about the assassination is called the history of the JFK assassination. I'm sorry. It's the hidden history of the JFK assassination. And it's by Lamar Waldron. Now, it seemed to me to be a very well-written book that didn't go off on too many flights of fancy, but I haven't read 10 books on them. Maybe I would read 10 and think they all felt that way. Yeah. Um, but what I will say, just because of what you mentioned, is and um, Oliver Stone in JFK Revisited says the same thing, which is that there were, theoretically, two previous plans to assassinate Kennedy, mm. one in Chicago and the other in Tampa both happening right before he got to Dallas that, and uh, I won't go into what are the details of what the book that I read speculates about this, but yeah. that there might have been multiple plans with multiple patsies with multiple shooters all set up one after the other to try to get Kennedy with Dallas being the third. Wow. So we're back at the offices at, uh, in New Orleans, man, this is just such a great cast. <laughs> we're going to have <laughs> of all this team. Like we see Wayne Knight, who's there, who's yeah. great. Uh, and this is the first that we hear over the fact that he used this World War II Italian-made Manlika Carcano rifle, which is not a particularly good rifle, uh, which Oswald ordered from a mailing house and shipped to him. Maniacal Jesus Christ, action. anybody can get a rifle in Texas. Uh, as far as Oswald's uh, associates, uh, boss, the uh, one name keeps popping up is David Ferry. Who was a hotshot pilot for Eastern Airlines and had some interactions with Oswald. And we see, and again, this is, uh, and, and, you know, normally on the cinephiles, we try to explain moment by moment almost everything that's happening. And there's so much happening throughout all of this, because in all of these scenes where you're having these conversations, it's constantly cutting to images. Some yeah. images are directly related to what we're talking about. So when you hear them talk about the rifle, you see the rifle. Yeah. Some of the images are from elsewhere. And one of them is they're talking about the rifle and we see this photograph, which is this very famous photograph of Oswald holding the yeah. rifle. But we don't know where that photograph came from or anything about it. That's something we're going to fill in later. Yeah. We also meet, again, he's so good in this movie, is Michael Ricker, who plays Bill. Yeah, Michael Rooker, uh, for those of you who maybe don't know Michael Rooker, was in other films before Guardians of the Galaxy. 
This is a young Michael Rooker. Uh, and we're about to get to Laurie Metcalf as well. So, yeah, this is he's such a great energy to have in this film because we had just talked about him, right, a few months ago or uh, maybe longer than that in Mississippi Burning and what a uh, mean, ruthless villain he is in that movie. And you look at here and he's got that same Southern energy, but it's a little more turned down. He's much more following Garrison's lead, but there's still that electricity in the room with someone like Michael Rooker, and you kind of need that on this team. Well, what's so good is there's uh, he creates all sorts of conflict. We're going to have a lot of conflict, yes. but it's not, I don't think you get a sense of, they kind of do it, and it changes, by the way, with the director's cut, which is something we haven't talked about, yeah. but I don't think you get a sense of Lou is right and Bill is wrong. You know what I right. mean? Right, right. You get a sense of they're in conflict. Yes, he is the doubting Thomas of the whole situation up yeah. until that moment that he breaks away. Yeah. And and again, because we're doing multiple things at once, in addition to having this conversation about who David Ferry is, what his connection to Oswald is, where the rifle came from and seeing all this footage, they also have the TV on. And as you mentioned that, uh, Susie, who is Lori Metcalf, who's also fantastic in this movie, that she is there and that what we're seeing on the TV. And if you know anything about the Kennedy assassination, you recognize the footage because it's Oswald coming out in the moment before he's about to get shot. Yeah. And it is still just so crazy to me that this was allowed to happen or planned to happen, depending on how you frame this, you know? And this footage is available on YouTube. If you want to watch the actual footage, it is harrowing because obviously Oliver shoots it from real close, but the actual footage is a little farther away and you see Ruby just walk right up in there. and Boom, boom, boom. And the fact that he's allowed to do it is just kind of crazy. Well, and this is the thing is there's a lot of corruption in the Dallas police department. Sure. And Ruby, who was a club, ran a club. There are cops at that club all the time. He's buddy, buddy with a whole bunch of cops. And when we talk about, you know, connections with the Godfather or connections, I didn't mention Goodfellas, but there are also even some connections there with the mob of like, he was good friends with all the cops. So of course they let him in the back door, but is that we could say that's part of a mob conspiracy, part of a cop conspiracy, part of a CIA conspiracy. If Ruby was running guns to Castro or running guns to Cuba, maybe he was running guns to anti Castro forces, but maybe he was connection with pro Castro forces and that it's Castro that sends Ruby into who knows. I mean, like this is where you go. This is where your brain starts to explode. Yeah. I cannot imagine you're already in shock from the death of Kennedy and then you're watching TV and right on national television. And they, and there are people who said, this is like the first live killing on national television. Yeah. You watch the main suspect get killed. And I think this is the event that sparks Cons- the conspiracy theories. Oh yeah. This is the event. The Ruby immediately killing the quote unquote Patsy or the lone gunman. So they cannot speak anymore. Cannot talk anymore. Cannot tell his side of the story. As he said earlier, the show he didn't have any representation. So no one had really stepped forward to represent him yet. And then boom, he shot before he can say a word. And j- just watching the shock play out in the room. Well, no trial now. It's like somebody just saved a Dallas DA a pile of work. Pandemonium is broken loose here in the basement of Dallas police. No. No, let's get David Ferry in here anyway. And again, this is Oliver Stone, the filmmaking, hitting at his theme. Because the next thing that we see is the documentary footage of the meeting with LBJ and Henry Cabot Lodge when, when they begin the process of escalating our involvement in Vietnam. Yeah. So... Are these connected? Is this connected to the Kennedy assassination or is it not? You know? It's a good question. And I I don't know the answer. Yeah. I, I, I really wish, it's funny. So I've read all that exists of the Robert Carroll books on LBJ. Mm. And I just continue to hope that he doesn't die before he finishes. Because <laughs> he's like 94 or something like that. And it's, you know, it's it's like more than George R. R. Martin. I want <laughs> this guy to finish this last book on LBJ. But I almost wanted to go back and reread the section of the Kennedy assassination to see if Robert Carroll gives any clues to this question. Oh, 
um, because there's no more exhaustive exploration of Lyndon Johnson's life than what Robert Caro is doing. Um, but I didn't do that. I didn't have the energy for that. <laughs> and, and by the way, this is a, uh, just to give a political background for people who are listening to us, um, about this, they may not know, but LBJ and Kennedy were at odds with each other very strongly through the oh, yeah. primary. And so the idea that Stone is taking advantage of him, by the way, in 1991, this is very well-known knowledge amongst most people in America in 1991, that LBJ and Kennedy had issues with each other, that LBJ, uh, they ran a very furious campaign against each other, and that LBJ did agree to be vice president, but he begrudgingly agreed to be vice president, and Jack needed him to do it so that they could carry the South. No way Kennedy wins without LBJ as his vice president. No way he wins the, the presidency. And so you have an uneasy relationship. So what Stone is taking advantage of here is the possibility that the more extreme people, uh, sorry, believers in the conspiracy theory, the more extreme believers think that LBJ played a role in this. I have never agreed to that or believed that, that LBJ was involved in this. But, you know, I think what Stone is doing is laying the groundwork that this went all the way up to the presidency because LBJ greenlight, greenlit all the stuff that happened in Vietnam and all these people making money off the weapons manufacturing that they did in Vietnam. So it's a bit irresponsible, but you can understand why he might go that route. Well, but this is, and this is why I'm so glad you point this out because this is what's so important about us doing this movie right now. And with us looking at the world that we live in and trying to figure out what the fuck is going around on some of the time <laughs> is that the only information that Oliver Stone gives us is this connection. Yes. That's all we have no other information. And so it's just, we hear about the military industrial complex we see that Kennedy is going to get us out of Vietnam. Yeah. Then he is killed. And then LBJ keeps us in Vietnam. Those have to be connected based right. on the way those facts are presented to us in this film. They might not be connected at all. And I will say too, by the way, and this does come from reading those Robert Carroll books, is first of all, the political acumen and level of political power of LBJ compared to Kennedy before Kennedy is elected president is no comparison. Yeah. LBJ is a hundred times more powerful than John Kennedy. He is the most powerful person to ever run the Senate. He is a, a political dynamo, a truly scary, intense, brilliant guy. And John and Bobby Kennedy did not like him. Nope. They didn't respect him. They didn't trust him. They didn't trust him and they cut him. Comp and he came in saying, look, I know more about delivering legislature than any other person in the country. I can help you. And they went, no, thanks. Mm -hmm. See you later. You know, Kennedy, it was the Kennedy arrogance. We, and, and this is what, you know, kind of, there's some cracks here in Camelot clearly is they felt like, no. And Robert was really the biggest one who, uh, you know, I know people still uh, want to revere Robert Kennedy, uh, but Robert was a rabble rouser and certainly yeah. didn't mind stepping on people's toes uh, in order to do what he needed to do. And certainly LBJ was one of those people. And of course, in 1968, it is Robert Kennedy's potential nomination as a Democratic nominee that forces LBJ to um, step down from the presidency and not seek re-election. And so there is a such a tangled relationship, a tangled web of a relationship between LBJ and the Kennedys and how they treated him. And LBJ had a very strong connection with uh, J. Edgar Hoover as well. So that's where that other element of this conspiracy theory uh, takes life. This is why this stuff works so well, is once you dig in a little bit, well, then you want to learn more and you want to learn more and you end up being political junkies like you and me. Yeah, true, true. And then intercut with this is that we're continuing to move the Kennedy story forward because now we're seeing those incredible shots of the funeral and of, you know, John Jr. and the salute and all. And as this is all setting up, in comes David Ferry, yeah. Joe Pesci to meet with Jim Garrison. What an interesting casting decision. And this is also the height of Joe Pesci in a way, you know, Home Alone and all these things. So, yep. yeah, yeah. Interesting. Right at Goodfellas. Yep. And uh, <laughs> would you like to know who was he originally wanted for this role? Oh, uh, you, please. Who? James Woods. Oh, interesting. Very different. Yeah, I could see it. But yeah, interesting. I like Pesci more. It's so unusual. You know, you know what Wood said? He said, uh, actually, I'd, I'll play Jim Garrison. <laughs> of course. But I'm not going to play that. The other two guys he went after, both of which turned down the role, are Willem Dafoe 
and John Malkovich. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think they both work. Uh, yeah, true, totally, totally. I th- it's so funny. We were just talking about just because we did uh, my cousin Vinny recently for a watch along, yeah. and we've been and and obviously we talked about Joe Pesci and the Irishman. Man, right. that guy's a good actor. Yes, he Joe is. Joe Pesci, man. Yeah. And I like that fairy, Dave Ferret, he's like a ferret in this whole movie. And so the the choice of him works with the the weird head the hairpiece and the bushy eyebrows. All of it just plays into immediately making you feel kind of like what Sissy Spacek felt Jim Garrison's wife did when she saw Lee Harvey Oswald for the first time. He gives me the creeps. This is also Stone using that on the audience by how he um, uh, puts the costume and the makeup and the hair and the and the eyebrows on Joe Pesci to make people feel the same way that this guy's immediately a creep and you don't trust him. Uh, and the back and forths with him and Garrison and and J. O. Sanders are are just great in this scene. You remember me, Mr. Garrison? I met you on Carondelet Street right after your election. I congratulated you. How could I forget? You make quite a first impression. Uh, by the way, Dave Ferry did have alopecia, so he had no hair on his body, yeah. and that's why he has a wig and these crazy eyebrows. And they start asking him questions about him being a pilot, and uh, which he supposedly he was a an excellent pilot, and b if there was gun running going into Cuba, maybe that David Ferry was flying some of those flights. And again, it could be that he was running guns with Jack Ruby. It could be he was running guns for the CIA. It could be that he was running guns for the mafia, or it could be that all of those things are true. Right. You know, we've heard reports that Oswald spent the summer here in New Orleans, and we've been advised that you knew Oswald pretty well. I never met anybody named Oswald. (laughs) Really? Where'd you hear that? (laughs) He's so good. And and look, um, Pesci does a great job when Garrison uh, Costner is talking about him being a great pilot, Pesci immediately begins the denial in his mind, right? He's immediately yep. laying there like, oh, what, what are you talking about? I'm not, I have nothing to do with this, you know? And so the Lee Harvey Oswald thing is, is so funny as it starts to progress in their, in their interrogation of him. And to be clear, and I think you'll agree, the evidence is that he absolutely knew Oswald. Oswald was on his, you know, whatever the, or his civil air patrol when he was yeah. a kid, yeah. you know? So he had known Oswald, but he denies that. No, I never saw him before my life. Well, that must have been mistaken information we got then. Thanks for straightening it out for us. And then we hear that he took a trip to Texas shortly after the assassination. It's going ice skating, man. Which apparently, by the way, it's even there's even more of an explanation that he apparently told them he was thinking about o- opening up his own ice skating rink in New Orleans. And he was doing research on ice skating rinks in Houston. <laughs> and we start punching holes in that. In the morning, we went goose hunting. You bagging the geese on this trip? I believe the boys got a couple. I love this whole conversation. <laughs> but the boys told us they didn't get any. Come to think of it, they're right. You know what? Come to think of it, they're right. <laughs> so good. I've never seen I've never seen anyone stamp out cigarettes quite the way Joe Pesci does his Dave Ferry. It's so good. Your young friends also told us you had no weapons in the car, Dave. Isn't it a bit difficult to hunt for geese without a shotgun? Yes. I remember now. I'm sorry, Mr. Garrison. I got confused. We got out near the geese. And only then did we realize we had forgotten our shotguns. <laughs> Stupid, right? <laughs> the button on this scene is... Oh, it's so best. good. It's so good, yeah. I'm sorry that this has to end inconveniently for you, but I'm going to have to detain you for further questioning by the FBI. Why? What's wrong? Dave, I find your story simply not believable. <laughs> and as he said now, he turns back and goes, Really? What part? Which part is if he can go back and make it believable? <laughs> it's so genius. It's so great. Well, well okay. So here's what, okay. So first of all, there are elements of this story that I think did happen. And yeah. there are elements of the story that I'm not sure that happened. Why does Dave Ferry have, I mean, if you're part of a conspiracy to kill the president, whether it's a CIA conspiracy or whatever it is, why does he have no explanation? Why is this, this such a shitty lie? Well, because he's not, what you're going to find out, and Steve, you know this already, but people will discover as they live life is that the people who radiate like they're in control or they're in uh, on top of stuff, the second they get confronted by actual authority, they fall to pieces. And so Barry was such a very, 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 very small part in the whole conspiracy theory and oh, conspiracy plan, if the, you know, if we're going with that. Um, so 
naturally amongst his crew. And as we see later when he's going crazy in front of Kevin Bacon and, and Tommy Lee Jones, that's where he fails his power in front of other people. But once he gets in front of someone with actual power, he reverts back to being the little uh, mouse that he actually is and just stumbles around and fumbles around with his words. So you don't give him too much. So you let him do a little bit, but not a lot because he's just not a actually strong person. So it totally makes sense that he would just kind of be caught off guard and not know how to make up a lie, not know where the questions are that he's going to be asked because he's not really that important in the whole grand scheme of this thing. Well, this is what's so hard with this movie of like, we definitely have these chess pieces that are in yeah. play yeah. that we think are involved. And I definitely think David Ferry is involved. Sure. But depending on which conspiracy scenario you have, those chess pieces are doing different jobs and have different levels of power. Like the, to some degree, the way the movie is framed, because we haven't gotten to him yet, but we're going to meet Clay Shaw, who is also, you know, Clay Bertrand, who's going to actually get put on trial. Yeah. It seems to me from what I have read that he probably might have been involved, but not in a, he's a lesser figure. Right. Considering he was the person who was put on trial. Um, right. The other one, it, 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 the person who was mentioned in this film, but I will spoil from the book that I read is very, very prominent is Carlos Marcello, which mm -hmm. is a key mobster that, and cause what, what from, from my research and correct me if you felt any differently is that most of the background they mention of David Ferry seems relatively accurate in this film. Yes. Yeah. In the yeah. film it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But with the exception of they don't mention anything about his association with Carlos Marcello, which is extensive. Right. Sent David Ferry over to the FBI expecting that they would also investigate his ridiculous stories. And then we hear from a press conference that the FBI has released him and finds no connection with Lee Harvey Oswald. And the press conference, they make it very clear that it wasn't them who brought in Dave Ferry, that it was the New Orleans DA. Yeah. This is the beginning of the narrative around Jim Garrison, which some people still to this day promote and push in their analysis of what happened here is that it was uh, not a lone gunman. It was a lone prosecutor in a uh, rogue prosecutor here right. in Jim Garrison going after this, doing rattling the cages, getting uh, upstanding citizen Clay Shaw in front of the court. And Dave Ferry here brought in for questioning. The FBI makes it clear that it wasn't their idea. And so already we're beginning this separation from and I think Lou makes a comment about that as well as how they, they make it clear. Like, I thought we were on the same side, but clearly we're not. So, yeah. Well, and it's got to be, I think one of the things that has to happen in this film is you go from what I would call the greatest generation World War II perspective of America is not perfect, but we're all fighting for the same thing. You know, we're, we're, we're all trying for the truth. We're striving towards a certain American vision. And I think David Ferry getting released so quickly is part of what erodes that is they yeah. go, wait, that whole, I thought we were on the same side and all that. Because, and again, we were in the scene with David Ferry as he's talking about the geese. We know he's full of shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the fact that the FBI released him so quickly, we're, as the audience going, along with Jim Garrison, what the heck is going on here? Yeah. yeah. And then we hear that President Johnson is creating a blue ribbon presidential commission to probe the events of Dallas. And this is really a who's who of, of Washington people. Obviously, it's the Warren uh, Commission, which is headed by Earl Warren, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And as a liberal, Earl Warren, the Warren Court, the, this is my guy because yeah. this is Brown versus Board of Education, Loving versus Virginia. This is the most important court in terms of the civil rights movement. Yeah. And so I would feel really good about Earl Warren being in charge of this. And Gerald Ford is on this, who will later be president of the United States, and Alan Dulles who was the ex-chief of the CIA, who we later found out was fired by Kennedy, yeah. is on this commission, and they're going to find out the truth. And the truth is that Lee Harvey Oswald was a lone gunman yep. and that there's no evidence of any conspiracy or everything. And they did an exhaustive investigation, John, 26 volumes of information to show how exhaustive this was. So problem solved, no mystery, we are good. Yep. We're good. It was just three years. Well, move on. Yep. It's done. Three years go by and we're on an airplane. And again, I had totally forgotten to this guy's in this movie. Another 
goddamn pro shows up in the form of Walter Matthau. Yeah. We're young people. Look, you can't tell a boy from a girl anymore. I saw a girl the other day. She was pregnant. You could see a whole belly. And you know what you had painted on it? Love, child. <laughs> Apparently, super unassuming as an actor. This is the description that I read. Mm -hmm. Showed up completely prepared. Because, again, these are guys that just had to come in and nail one scene. Yeah. Shows up completely prepared, you know, on time for his call, in his makeup, sitting down, didn't bother anybody, didn't put on any airs. Mm -hmm. Kevin Costner comes in, sits down next to Mathau. Mathau has no idea who Kevin Costner is. <laughs> That's awesome. Also, great choice. You mentioned Failsafe earlier. Walter oh, yeah. Mathau, a part of Failsafe. Yeah. Yep. Um, and apparently they just laughed all day, Kevin Costner and Mathau. Oh, wow. I mean... What a I I don't know what the stories are, but I would love to. Walter Matthau would have been a great person to sit down with. I agree. We've bitten off more Vietnam than we could possibly chew. Of course, it figures with that pole cat Linden in the White House. Again, hitting these points that are the Oliver Stone points that the Kennedy assassination is directly connected to Vietnam. You know, I sometimes think things have gone downhill since John Kennedy died, Senator. Well, don't get me started on that. Those Warren Commission fellas were picking that shit out of pepper. It's a pure exposition scene. Yeah. There's, and, and Walter Matthau, through his just awesome performance and the way it's edited, makes it thrilling. Well, and also this scene establishes yet even more forcefully, because in the beginning, he's establishing the foundation of everything. Then you fall in love with Kennedy. He's lining up the antagonist to the story. He's now been separated from the FBI, so he's kind of on his own. And here is this thing three years later on a plane randomly talking to Senator Russell Long from Louisiana. And they're having a back and forth. And here is Costner saying what so many baby boomers said after the assassination of Kennedy, that the country was never the same after the death of Kennedy. So he is using Costner, using Costner's garrison to say the things that a lot of people in 1991 who grew up around the assassination believe themselves. So there's a certain point of view that you're getting there. And then you have someone established like Russell Long, Senator Russell Long, saying the things that he's saying to inspire Garrison to possibly explore this and have some doubt put into his mind about the assassination of Kennedy. And by the way, let me throw this out there. I don't know if you have this in your notes, Steve, but apparently there were 12 speech therapists that were extras on the plane with Walter Matthau and uh, Kevin Costner. Oh, really? To, to make sure he got the Louisiana accent right. And this is his quote. I, this is Walter Matthau. I was playing Russell Long, the senator from Louisiana. I had 12 speech teachers watching me on the plane. All the other passengers on the airplane were speech teachers. And every time I got it wrong, one of the speech teachers <laughs> would jump up and correct it. So... Just this little scene, you even had all these people who understood the uh, accent of Louisiana that trying to get that right. And I think Mathau nails it. He is so good in this character because it's smart in the writing as well. You have him say a funny story, so immediately you like him, you're on yeah. board with him. He's not judgmental of the flowers. He thinks it's funny and it's a funny joke and it's cool. It's not denigrating. It's funny. And then he goes in and says, don't tell me about that. They were picking that shit out of Peppa, blah, blah, blah. And so you now kind of light in. And by the way, this is the son of the legendary Huey Long, who all the King's Men is about. Right. So this is a very interesting lineage that you're exploring here with Huey Long, or with uh, Russell Long, who I think served in the Senate until the 90s. So, wow. Yeah. By the way, the, the New Orleans, Louisiana accent is among the weirdest in America. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. it's not like, because when you're in the South, you're kind of moving through variations of the South as you go from Georgia to Alabama to Mississippi. Once you get into Louisiana and you have all that Creole and Arcadian and French and all in Spanish and all these other yeah. influence, it gets thrown. It is a really weird accent. There are a yeah. bunch of weird accents in there. It is. It is. Um, but, and the other thing that's going to, we're, we're going to hit another one of the things that just doesn't make sense. Mm. And that is talking about the actual firing of that rifle. Nobody's going to tell me that kid did the shooting job he did from that damn bookstore. I thought the FBI testified the rifle to see if it could be done. Sure, three experts, and not one of them could do it. They're telling us that Oswald got off three shots with world-class precision 
from a manual bolt action rifle in less than six seconds. And according to his marine buddies, he's got Maggie's drawers. You know what that mean? Wasn't any good. And now we see Oswald firing, because again, this idea of B-roll. Again, we're gonna reinforce what we're hearing. Average man be lucky to get two shots off. And I tell you, the first shot would always be the best. Here, the third shot's perfect. And then they got that crazy bullet zigzagging all over the place, so it hits Kennedy and Connolly seven times. Ah, one pristine bullet, that dog don't hunt. Now, we don't know what the magic bullet theory is yet. Right, no. We're just teasing, and again, you're teasing these things ahead of time. Right. For those of us who know, we're like, oh, yeah, we're super yeah. Kennedy assassination nerds. Oh, yeah, right, the magic bullet. But for people who don't know, he's laying the groundwork for something he's going to revisit, as you said, Steve, so well already throughout the first part of this movie. And then he says what he would do. If I were investigating the case, I'd round up 100 of the world's best riflemen, find out which ones were in Dallas that day. You've been dug hunting. I think Oswald's a good old-fashioned decoy. What do he say? I'm just a patsy? You better believe it. That is a pure expository scene made completely thrilling yeah. by great writing, a fantastic performance, and as you said at the very beginning, the editing that makes, so we're feeling the assassination happen as it's being described. And we're seeing the laying of the groundwork of the conspiracy point of view that Garrison is now going to follow for the rest of this movie. It's a really interesting film in that way as well, Steve, because normally, and I'm sure Costner is one of these guys that wanted this, normally a lead actor wants to be the one who is pushing the narrative along, who is the one that figures it out first and wants to go after it. So it's, it's rare when it's another character that is inspiring the lead character to go after this uh, uh, situation or, or follow this path. And so the fact that they have that here, and we never, I don't think we ever see Long again in the rest of the no. movie. It's just to inspire uh, Garrison to look at it differently just from this conversation. And from here, we're following now Garrison and Costner as they go down the path here to find out what happened to Jack Kennedy. Well, and while life doesn't generally follow movie structure, sometimes it does, but not usually. In this case, this is a perfect jumping off point. And he really did, by the way. I believe he really was on a plane yes. with Russell Long, who really did express his doubts about the Warren Commission report. And it is those doubts that's going to lead Jim Garrison. He was done. He handed off ferry to the FBI. Yep. There's nothing more connecting it to New Orleans. But now, because of this conversation... He is going to start studying, I would say, obsessively studying yeah. the Warren Commission report and the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And at this moment that Jim Garrison is digging in what for what will be his life's work, I think is a good time to end part one of our exploration of JFK. John, this is going to be a long bunch of episodes. Oh, yes, it is. But we knew this one would be a lot of conversation and exposition and conversation about um, oh, but sorry, back and forth about uh, the Kennedy assassination and our experiences with it. Now that we've laid the groundwork, we're digging into the movie and now we're going to start going like a speeding train. Now the garrison has the impetus to go in. Now we're going to go into the next parts, uh, uh, moving a little bit quicker. But this has been a great first episode, a blast. And I knew it was going to be a blast to talk with you about this yeah. stuff. So just exciting stuff, man. I feel the same way. And of course, we'd love to hear your thoughts in particular if you are unfamiliar with the Kennedy assassination in this film and you've jumped into JFK for the first time, I want to know how you react to it yeah. because it is a, for me was a visceral experience, but for me, it was a visceral experience 30 years ago. Yeah. What is your experience today? As always, you can visit us on our Facebook page. Just do a search for Cine under the, for the cinephiles. You can follow us on Twitter, Cine underscore files, the cinephiles podcast on Instagram. Please subscribe to the show if you haven't already. Maybe your thing is on YouTube and you can subscribe there and leave your comments. Maybe you're more into Spotify or Google Play. And if you happen to be on Apple Podcasts and subscribe there, we would love you to leave a review. We work really hard on these shows, this one in particular, and a five-star review would mean a lot. Please uh, leave your reviews on Apple Podcasts. If you want to buy or stream uh, JFK, along with every other film we've ever reviewed, you can do it at cinephiles.net and you can support the show on patreon.com slash the cinephiles, where I can almost guarantee there will probably be an extra cinephile short or something <laughs> like that dealing yeah. with JFK. That's probably going to happen. And if you want to reach me, you can do it at SR Morris on Twitter, SR Morris one on Instagram. John, how would people reach you? 
Yeah, uh, you can always reach me at the Roka says on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok, the Outlaw Nation on Twitch, and my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash John Roka says, and my other podcast, the Hot Mike and the, the Geek Buddies. And I will say, along with this, I'd like to hear from, we'd like to hear from some of you all who are um, adamantly that it was a lone gunman, that it was Oswald, sure. that all this conspiracy stuff is nonsense. We are open to all opinions because we want you to enjoy our uh, breakdown of this movie. So, and we don't want you to feel excluded in any way, shape, uh, uh, or form at all. So, there we go. And I think that's it for this week. We will continue our exploration of the mystery wrapped in an enigma that is both the film and the assassination of John Fitzgerald Kennedy, JFK. Kennedy.